Okay, that messed with your NDI. Can you still hear me? I can hear you fine, this yeah. This is Mark. Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, hang on. Let me see if I can pop this thing up. Okay. Boom. There we go. go. All right, now i got to see if I can add you as a NDI source in, in out of the same call. I'm going to have a... I have a time trying this out. This is this is the first time we've done this. Give it to me. Yes, it works. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just got to fit you into the into the streamer thing here, Mark. Okay. Uh, Mark, this is my buddy Chase. He's a uh, Chase. Probably close. Yeah, this is my yeah. Chase Stanley. He's about to, hey. apart from. My, uh, he's the only brother I've got that I'm not related to. So he's a, <laughs> he's a real good friend of mine. <laughs> nice to meet you. You too. We're very glad to have you on. Cool. Thank you for being here. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see. I think that's going to work. Yeah. I think that's going to work. Actually, I can scoot you down a little bit. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share this, let y'all see what I'm working with here. Make sure everybody's okay with that. Okay. Okay. That's kind of what I'm looking at right now. Is that that good with everybody? I don't have it yet. As long as you see it on your machine, you're probably good. I don't know if you can... Oh, there it goes. Yeah, that looks good to me. Oh, I can see it. You, you good with that, Mark? Sure. All right. Just trying to make it stylistically not look like crap. <laughs> That's groovy. All right. Let me see here. Okay. That's that's shockingly going to work really well. Um, I've expanded the list of questions down to 23 uh, questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we... I know. I, I don't know. I was, I'm checking with you. That's part of the reason I got you here early. It's uh, we may, we may have follow up questions. Oh, <laughs> know, that's just fine. Depending on that's fine. depending on you know, how you answer and stuff. All right. That's fine. And, I mean, uh, I do. I do have Strange World to you know my my regular thing. I've got to do in two hours. Okay. Yeah. So. We ought to be done before then. Oh, we'll, we yeah. should be done by then. Yeah. Okay. Well, people we, say that, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, flat, we made them. I, I've had people say, "Oh yeah, we can we can totally do all these flat Earth questions in 20 minutes." I'm going, "No, no, you can't. Yeah, <laughs> nope. that never, no, you never can't. happen." We we yeah. say that because our the, the the last stream we did went two hours without us knowing it was going to go two hours, and so um, I am I'm extremely cognizant of time now. <laughs> Lots of people are like, "Yeah, it was great, hour, but an hour and a half though, I've got to tap out. I can't sit through a whole thing." <laughs> sure. Okay. Oh, I meant to ask you now that before we, before we really kick. Oh, Chase, uh, are you gonna? Are you got to get your, uh, your feed going on your other machine just to see it, do a sound check and all that. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it up now. Okay. Um, I meant to ask you about your mic, uh, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty it? cool. That's just uh, I've never seen. I don't want this a, to be. <laughs> it is a blue microphone series, and it's just a black one. Mm -hmm. So it's the same one that the uh, the BBC uses when they do their Doctor Who uh, Ood episodes, except that this one is black. Most uh, okay. of the time, people oh, get them cool. in white. Okay, but, but black okay. is actually blends in a lot more with things that I'm wearing. Okay, so yeah. it just doesn't stick out as much. So. I got you. I've just. I've... <laughs> I noticed that the last time we talked, and I didn't think to say anything about it. But I was just—I looked at it and went, "Oh, it's—it's it's a globe." It's a <laughs> well, that—that that is why specifically I did not get it in blue. <laughs> because had I gotten it in blue, no one would for, for would forgive me. Yeah, so white was bad enough. I had a white one for a better part of a year, and too many people were just giving me hell about it. So it's like, oh, uh, fine. So I got a black one. <laughs> Most people don't give me any grief. So, <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I did not really expect people to give you grief about that. Oh, sure. That. Are you kidding? The the flat Earth faithful are very twitchy when it comes to stuff like that. <laughs> they they do not mess around. Uh, in fact, it, in fact, if I use, which is why I give them equal time. So if I use a globe prop, I'm not going to do it on this. 
But if I have a globe prop in one hand and a flat earth model in the other, they'll be really good about, you know, making sure it's like you got to give them, you know, make sure you give the, the flat earth model equal time because I used to just use a globe model and say, oh, yeah, you know, I can disprove this because of this and this and this. And yeah. they, they just they, the only thing they focused on is why is he holding the globe? Why is he holding the globe? It's like, oh, guys, come on. So it's all right. I'll, I deal with it. <laughs> no, I'm with you, man. The shape, of the, microphone, yeah. the shape of the microphone, it should not be a big deal. Uh, yeah. I'm 100% uh, I, I actually it. like it, though. I like holding a microphone more than uh, the, the standard ones like that the you have over there. That Because otherwise, I keep forgetting. I, I'm, I'm, otherwise, I, you know, I have to keep remembering to lean in because I'll sure. tend to get yeah. animated. And then all of a sudden, I'm talking like this and the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and people go, I can't hear you. I can't. Hear oh, I'm sorry. I've done that too many times. So, um, and when I when I do station interviews, I'm like really, you know, I I make sure that I'm answering the questions to the microphone. I'm not even like looking at the people. I got you. So yeah, yeah. I got you. That makes a lot. I actually wondered about that because uh, when I was watching the doc, I noticed uh, you and Patricia had to get like right on top of each other almost to get her mic to to work for both of y'all. Right. And, uh, so I was wondering, like, I noticed that he holds his mic, but I also noticed his mic has legs. I'm just I'm yeah, not kind of thinking. Yeah, well, I wonder why he does that. Set it down and two, actually, and you were probably wondering, like, why do I keep the legs open like this? Uh -huh. uh, it's because I can rest it right on my chest, and okay. it it makes it extremely stable, so that yeah. I'm not over miking or under miking. It's just right here, and if I have to adjust it, there's a small little movement. So most people can't even tell that. Like, yeah, the legs are like digging into my chest the entire time. Wow. Yeah. But it's but it's uh, better than actually just trying to hold I used to like hold it like a I I I actually thought of using like a stage mic, you know, a full blown stage sure, mic yeah. and it's like, yeah, again, you run into those same problems cuz all of a sudden your your hand gets animated for whatever reason and you just like, let me tell you about the globe. It's uh, <laughs> and then they, oh, it kills me. <laughs> so, I this is my, this is my solution to the 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 micro the stable microphone problem. And uh, I'm just lucky. Cap. I used to wear headphones a lot too, uh, but the new system that I got, the the lag is so minimal that I almost never run into any reverb or, or feedback. So it, it, it works out. It's right. just a, an Alienware tower. So oh, wow. uh, and because I've got, I don't know, when I wear headphones on my head, I can't wear them that long before they start pressing down on me. Yeah. I'm one of those guys that just cannot. I don't know what is like jewelry. Anything that's pressing on my skin just drives me insane. So if the CIA are listening, that's my torture right there. Yeah, just make them wear anything. Here, here's a necklace, wait, wait, wait. a ring, and a set of headphones. We'll see you in 24 hours. You don't work for them already? I thought they would know this. That's, that's, what, that's what I heard. Stay on the agency, A. Eh? Um, yeah, I get accused of that more often than... I mean, I've been accused of a lot of things, but I've been accused of just about every alphabet group you can imagine. <laughs> um, why not? Uh, it, but but that's mostly because of people are always suspicious of when when somebody gets any sort of light shown on them. Mm -hmm. uh, even me, you know, I look at people that have more subscribers than I do, and I immediately think, oh, he's doing something shady. Yeah, there's, there's nothing <laughs> legit about that guy. He, he could have he could have five thousand more subs than me, and I'll, I'll start squinting. I'll start looking. It's like, okay, what's this guy's deal? <laughs> All right. And so everybody does it. And when, I mean, there are flat earthers. I mean, I'm, I'm barely in the top 10 of flat earth subscribers of people in flat earth that have subscribers, but I do a lot of interviews. That's right. the difference because uh, I make myself available and, and, uh, and I, and I've, that's why I've labeled myself, which is look, you want, you want the introduction to flat earth? <laughs> You're probably gonna end up talking to me anyway. So, uh, but but because of that, people say, "Oh, that guy, you know, he was on this show or this show." It's like, oh man. So yeah, I have to defend myself constantly. Not as much as Patricia, but uh, but quite a bit. She's just was she's just harassed because she's, well, uh, she's a triple threat. She's a woman. She's beautiful, uh, and she's Jewish. Oh, she's so, Jewish, really? Right, but, but, but you didn't notice the the shockingly red hair. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, steer. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but but yeah, yeah. I so mean, uh, I think, but yeah, her. So her mother was. So she's, I uh, think, okay. fifty percent. I'm going to screw up this name. Ashkenazi, is that right? 
Ashkenazi okay, the, Jew. Maybe. Maybe. Well, anyway, yeah. so yeah, the, the point is 50%, that's enough to get you on the train. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's, yeah, that's basically it. But, uh, but yeah, she has to fight people up all the time, and I'm incredibly proud of her for just sticking to her guns. I mean, there's, most, there's a lot of women that have folded. Because they just couldn't take the the harassment. I mean, yeah. I mean, come on, the the YouTube comment section that's just a den of vipers. Yeah. You just, I, yes. pe people say, "How do you do it?" I go, "I don't. I don't read the comments. I miss a lot of compliments, <laughs> but I miss a lot more people that just come after my head." Oh, they call me all sorts of horrible. You know, the the saying is, um, I know you got to start this thing in a second. Uh, the saying is, uh, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. That's not what I say anymore. I, if if you can't say something nice, you're probably in the YouTube forums. That's, <laughs> that's that's basically where you are because it is just ugly, ugly, ugly. Where people, I mean, seriously, you could make, but it's it's not just flat Earth. You could make a video about a, a puppy chasing a kitten through a meadow and a butterfly circling above them, and within I think a hundred hits, you're gonna have somebody come in and say, "This is the most effing stupid gay stuff I've ever seen." <laughs> Unsub, thumbs down, you know. And here's what I have to say about oh, I don't know everything else. You know, I'm just gonna wind up on you. Uh, I've I have <laughs> rarely seen a video go a hundred and zero. Rarely. Wow. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. There's what? people that just they they get satisfaction. Be I'm gonna be the first thumbs down. And I'm going to do it with style and like, oh yeah, painful childhoods that, uh, and it's been that way since, uh, I know you're probably not old enough to remember, but, uh, when the internet forums came out back in the nineties, I mean, oh, it oh, was yeah. since yeah. <laughs> week one, all of a sudden, all these guys were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can use an alias. I'm anonymous. And, uh, yeah. I'm anonymous <laughs> and I can say anything I want and no one's going to catch me ever. And, and then all you could hear, you could hear their knuckles cracking in the background. Going, it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna wind up on all you chuckleheads, and they would to where. Um, do you remember the um, uh, the Jay and Silent Bob movie, uh, the second one? Uh, oh yeah. Stri they strike back right where they use their movie right. money at the end and literally they just fly around the country and beat up kids that said <laughs> horrible things in the forums. I hate to say it, but that fantasy is not outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> it is not. I mean, you, you watch these kids and you go, oh, oh, if I ever get my genie, you know, my Aladdin's lamp, I am coming after all of you doing horrible things. Anyway, sorry. those are my favorite kinds of people, man, is honestly like I, I like to go in and OK, you got a 12 page rant about how stupid this author is. Um However, that's not an argument. <laughs> that's, well, that's yeah, just that's just insulting. it. I mean, there, it's not it, the the cohesiveness of, of any of the arguments just fall. I mean, everything deteriorates so quickly. It's like it immediately. And, and of course, once one person gets offended by that first post, then it just yeah. becomes cyclical, which is like, OK, I'm going to also throw in comments about your mother, your religion, <laughs> your sexuality. Right. Uh, just about everything you think you know, and we're gonna just lump all these into a big mess, and and then everybody, you know, oh, it's awful, awful. I mean, yeah. I've got videos now that have thirty, forty thousand comments on them, just like a single video. Wow. How how could I even nice. imagine to? I couldn't go through that. I and people say, why don't you read them? I go, because I want to sleep at night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not going to sit there and read. I mean, I've seen people burst into tears after only like 10 or 12 comments. You know, you're going to, I'm going to sit there and read a thousand comments about how horrible I am and what an idiot I am. No, 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 never going to happen. Anyway. Oh, uh, gentlemen, that's a, uh... That's seven o'clock, so I'm gonna start the stream. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna wait for Chase to tell me uh, he sees it on our on our channel, and then okay. it might take five or six seconds. But we may we'll see if it see if we got something going here. Okay. So we ought to be seeing it at any second now. Which, if it works the first time, this part's going to be on it, too. That's the best part of a live stream. You can't really cut things. <laughs> I don't have anything yet. Yeah, I don't either. It's saying 
that it's still not live. All right. Nope, that's not it. Yeah, it's saying it's not live yet. All right, I'm gonna check, make sure all my, make sure my live stream stuff is correct. It's always great when it works before you try to go live and then it stops. <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite. Not my favorite. Not at all. Oh gosh, I gotta find the right thing here. The new beta studio is really jacking with me. Oh, the YouTube beta studio? Yeah, the cl- um, there it is. I'll try to go back to classic really quick. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I do not do the beta studio yet. <laughs> not until... I, honestly, I'm just probably going to hold out until they force me. Yeah. I'm with you, because I don't, I don't want it either. <laughs> I mean, it's fine, but it's... Look, we're testing it for them. Like, look, you've got a beta program staff, don't you? Why are you throwing it on us? Right. Here, try this right. out for free. And if it breaks your stuff, well, it's still free. Yeah, it was free. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want that. I don't want to create a new stream. Where is my... Encode, there it is. Encoder set up. I'm going to go ahead and go in and make sure that that's in OBS correctly. Settings. Stream. It was not. <clears throat> I think they change it periodically on YouTube to keep it from being a, being co-opted. And... I can see that. All right, Chase, round two. You ready? Yep, whatever you are. Boom. All right, that, that looks like it. Very good. All right, everybody, welcome back to the monthly stream for the After Church Para Ministry podcast. We got a lot of stuff we do. We got to figure out a better name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, we just call it After Church. Joining us tonight is our special guest, Mr. Mark Sargent. If you have not seen the Netflix doc, well, I don't know if you want me to tell him, go watch the Netflix doc. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. (laughs) You've not seen the uh, Netflix documentary, Behind the Curve. This is the protagonist, one of the main protagonists in the the doc. I highly recommend that y'all go check that out. And uh, we can also check out our website. Want to make sure we always encourage that. Chase, you just got smaller. I'm going to fix you, buddy. Here we go. Boom. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I'm not that important to this stream tonight. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You'll say that. You'll say that. <laughs> We're all but, so, special snowflakes. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Oh, and Mark got smaller, too. I'm going to have to start keep fixing uh, y'all. Don't worry not. about me. <laughs> Most of the people are just going to listen to my side anyway. <laughs> So what we're going to do tonight with Mark Sargent, I'm going to let him introduce himself first, and then we're going to talk about a uh, pretty important topic. Man, you guys just, they don't want you guys to stay big. I'm just going to make, you know what? I might make, make me smaller. I don't know. <laughs> we're going to talk about the uh, the topic of understanding scripture, and we're going to talk about how do we go about getting a right interpretation, and uh, how do we know what we uh, what we believe about Scripture is the is the way Scripture would have us uh, to believe. But before we do that, we'll let Mark introduce himself. So, Mark, can you give us the five ten minute story about who you are, what your fame, what you've become famous for? I guess sure, uh, and sure. Uh, just what your role is in this movement. Yeah, you bet. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent. I am currently the freshman recruiter for the metaphorical <laughs> university that is called Flat Earth. Uh, and by that, it is the literal interpretation. So that what we mean is you are not living on this tiny little rock that's covered by a thin sheen of water, which is covered by even a thinner sheen of smoke or atmosphere going through the universe in five different directions and five different velocities. Um, You are instead living in a building, a structure, a planetarium, a terrarium, uh, a Truman show from the 1998 movie with walls and a floor and a ceiling. One that was so big and so complex that even our best and brightest scientists didn't figure it out until about 1960. 
And that would have been the United States and the Soviet Union. And when they did, they decided to keep it a secret. Even though they didn't build it, they didn't weren't sure if the general public would be able to understand the ramifications of it. So they kept it under wraps, for lack of a better term. And it was. It was kept under wraps from 1960 all the way up until about 2015, when a few of us in the social network, social media community decided to bring it back to life. And with the help of high-speed internet and social media and six billion smartphones, we created what I think will eventually be called Flat Earth 2.0. If Flat Earth 1.0 has always been around. Uh, you know, Flat Earth was embraced by just about every culture you could think of for thousands of years. And up until about 500 years ago, that's what everybody believed. We believed what we observed. And that was the sky was moving, not the Earth. And that it appeared to be some sort of dome structure over us. And we were like a, a snow globe, God's footstool as it were. And then Copernicus came in, came in to view and created the heliocentric model. And the Earth did not, was not the center of the universe anymore. It was just this tiny little cog and this giant universe machine uh, with impossible distances. And now we're kind of going back to that uh, in a big way. We have now created, and I know we'll, we'll talk about this more, We've created a way of explaining the flat earth that is easier to understand than the globe model. And that is why it's been spreading so fast. And let me sum it up with this, uh, the intro with this. Because of that, now, and, and the help of celebrities and the help of YouTube, mostly, because uh, most of our content resides on YouTube, and of course the documentary and the book and all the other stuff that came out. Uh, people are suckers for the easy stuff. There's an old saying in uh, the, the Chinese book, uh, uh, Sun Tzu wrote it, uh, The Art of War. It was really the only thing I took from the book, which is people are like water. They always take the path of least resistance, which is a nice way of saying that people are lazy. People will always choose the laziest option. They always will. If you have any doubt, ask yourself why you text all the time, you know, when you should be just calling them. It's one button to call them and you're, you're texting a lot until your thumbs break off. Uh, so that's what's happening. And the science has been trying to battle us for the last four years with mathematics. And what I try to tell them is like, look, math won't save you in this case, because the average person on the street doesn't even know basic algebra, let alone geometry and trigonometry and calculus and quantum mechanics. So uh, science is having a very, very tough time of, of combating this to where, last part, I, I swear, to where National Geographic, when they had me uh, under the gun uh, last year, they actually asked me what happens when flat earth gets outside of our control? What happens to medicine? What happens to technology? What happens to science? What happens to civilization as we know it? Could, could flat earth be leading people back to the dark ages? And I thought that was a little heavy handed uh, to where I said, look, uh, I, I'm a glass half full type of guy. I think potentially it's a new golden age. Uh, and what we'll get into here in a bit is, is religion plays a huge part of it. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to Flat Earth, but the one that seems to grab hold of people the tightest is the spiritual angle, uh, which is why at least, last part, I swear to God, it's the last part, uh, which is the, the at least 50% of the Americans that are involved, uh, I can't speak for every other country, uh, at least 50% of the Americans are hardcore Christians. In the flat earth community mm -hmm. and that and i have heard from flat earth uh people in the in the in the on the strong strong christian side say we have never seen a recruiting tool that brings people back to the church as much as this thing does because mm -hmm. if you were on the fence about if there's a god or not this has a high degree of probability of pushing you back into the camp of being a believer Hmm. There you go. There's my intro. And I just kind of <laughs> winged that one. <laughs> I, I don't Very really have a cool. standard intro. I just kind of go where it feels. Uh, I, I wouldn't, oh, I don't know this for sure, but I don't, you've probably not done this particular topic in, in regards to flat earth uh, to this point. I, all the interviews I've seen from you have been uh, people trying to nail you on the science of it. I don't think I've ever seen an interview about the religion side. But believe it or um, not, coincidentally, over the last... I, they haven't been published yet. In fact, I had... Um, you guys have probably heard of um, 
uh, TBN, Trinity Broadcasting mm-hmm. Network. They mm-hmm. they flew up here sure. and uh, just before I went down to the New Zealand conference and completely unsolicited, I had no idea. And they, we sat down for an hour with a full crew uh-huh. and they shot me and asked me a lot of tough questions, you know, to the point, you. you know, it's like, is is flat earth salvational? For one, and uh, how does huh. it how does it affect you know the churches? We know what you know where we are now, where we're moving forward. So that I don't know when they're going to air that. So yeah, it is rare that uh, I, I get a, a strong Christian group that will will ask the question. So anyway, go ahead. I got you. So uh, so tonight, uh, oh, that's that's I guess that's the next question we wanted to touch on is your. Uh, the whole of the genesis of this, and I want to apologize to the audience first off, as you, if you've just joined us, uh, or you know, you, you may not see this. I think I've got it fixed. But for those of you who were here earlier, our my streaming thing is really kind of making my, my windows jump around. So I think I've got it worked out. Uh, hopefully, we will we'll have some consistency. Sorry about you know Mark and Chase changing sizes radically a several a couple times. Chase got really big at one point. Sorry about that. Uh, but but uh, the the genesis of this was. Uh, I was watching the doc, right? And one of the one of the things that stuck out more than anything to me was uh, something that your mom said, mm-hmm. um, and she said she mentioned something to the degree of she was uh, actively praying for for you and for this work and that the truth would be known and whatever the truth is, right. uh, that it was her her prayer, right? And and so uh, as a as a yeah, you know, seminary guy, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I guess I'm an apologist first, and I'm a theologian second, and I, I, uh, I listen for that kind of stuff, and that, that idea of, uh, clearly, the hit this guy's mom is a believer, uh, she's she's a uh, a Christ follower, and right. I would assume that she would raise her son to be that, and so that kind of got me thinking, you know, is uh, where does Mark stand on this, and sure, can you talk can you talk a little bit about um. I guess your spiritual journey and how, yeah. like where you started and where you went and how you, how you got back to where you are now. Yeah. Well, with a mother like mine, uh, no doubt uh, <laughs> I was, I was going to be raised in a, uh, a, a very active born again, Christian home to where mm-hmm. church was definitely, and kind of fits in with your show. Church was not just a Sunday thing. Not, right. not yeah. even close. Yeah. In fact, I was very lucky. Uh, growing up in the island in the 70s and 80s, we had a tremendous youth group program that was here uh, mm-hmm. to where we did you, you know youth group on other days of the week. And I went to vacation Bible school you know, during the summer and even Camp Malibu up in um, British Columbia. With, you know, we'd take big groups up there. And it was, it was something. But however... Because I lived on a rural island up in the northwest corner of the United States, you know, northwest of Seattle. I mean, really, really close. I and mean, you can see Canada from just just up the road here. Uh, my my upbringing was very, very sheltered. So the second I went to university, my mind, as a lot of people just can imagine, was open to a lot of things. Because I, it's like, wait, wait, there's there's more than one religion? What are you talking about? I never, I never <laughs> I heard of it. <laughs> Uh, and I was very, very naive in that sense to where, uh, and so it was like this perfect storm of things that pulled me away from spirituality. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the combination of, of a lot of, not, not just all the other religions, but technology, because I was a big tech guy. I was into the internet before there was the internet. You know, I was one of the few guys in my university that even had a personal computer at home. And that was like, and my love of games, um, I love trying to figure things out. I love strategic games. I loved any kind of games. Uh, just kept my mind going. I have a hard time sleeping. You know, I just think, think, think. And (laughs) because of that, uh, I, you know, church was put on the back burner for a long time. I mean, decades. And because I just got deeper into it. I mean, I ended up starting working at, (laughs) okay. Not only did I end up playing video games for a living, (laughs) Right off the bat, which and once you start playing games for a living, you're in with a group of guys, hardcore gamers. I mean, I, I, some of my best friends were some of the finest gamers in the world. Uh, and then I worked for tech companies on top of it. And between those two things, I didn't have time for really anything. I never got married. You know, I never had kids. It was like I was always, if my mind wasn't being stimulated by stuff, I wasn't interested. And don't get me wrong, the, the Bible and all the, the wonderful biblical uh, tales and stories were, were very interesting, but I've read, you know, I've read them 
and seen them, done them, right? And right. so I was yeah. looking for the new, the new stuff, at, you know, that was out there. What what was new in the world? And also, once I I also got into conspiracies after a while. Once you got on the internet, back when the internet was new, back then, boys and girls, remember nine <laughs> eleven? Yeah, I mean, the internet was so new when nine eleven came out. Uh, that no one, that, like, that was like one of the first, in fact, I didn't even know, here's, here's a quick side thing for you. Uh, I didn't even know, didn't even believe that conspiracies existed. I didn't think the people in authority would lie about anything. Why would I? I grew up on a rural island. I mean, what I, what, the news is absolutely true, right? Everything that you saw on network television, whatever channel it was, it's like, oh, that's, that's the truth right there. And then I saw JFK in the theater. That was the first introduction ah. to, you know, Oliver Stone's masterpiece. I don't care what he made after that. Nothing compared to JFK. And the blend of real footage and his footage was so seamless that, and I saw it opening weekend, that by the time I walked out of the theater, I was walking out of a packed house of angry people. You know, people, because the internet wasn't even up when this thing, when this thing came out. People were like, oh, yeah. I was going, wow, people do lie. And <laughs> so I got into conspiracies and went down just about every rabbit hole you could think of. And had an opinion. I still do. I have an opinion on every conspiracy you can think of. Uh, some I like, some I don't like, some I think are kind of silly, some I think are a stretch, uh, to where I got bored with them. And yeah. then all of a sudden, I mean, I really, honestly, I was like, oh, I've seen it. I've done it. I, I There's an old commercial, television commercial. It's like, well, I finished the internet. You know, that, that was like how I felt. Yeah. I'd gone through everything <laughs> in the internet. And that, when the internet yeah. was new, you actually could. You could actually go through all the main sites that are out there. And it's like, oh, what else is on TV? And <laughs> we, I, I got to 2014 and had, and you saw the documentary, so you know this part of the story, which is so 2014. And I said, oh, flat earth, that thing. Fine, I'll look at it. It's going to be horrible, but at least I can say I looked at it. It's on my, wasn't even on my bucket list. I tell people it was, it wasn't. It was not on my bucket list. And so I looked at Flat Earth and I said, oh, this is this is trash. There's there's nothing to this. I'll just shut it down in a weekend. And nine months later, I'm breaking my keyboard over my head going, why can't I shut this thing down? And to where in the beginning of 2015, that's when I made, I was just a cry for help, really. I just made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues because I figured, well, I'm clever, but the internet is more clever. The, the, you combine all the, the internet hive mind misses nothing. If a coffee cup moves in a frame of a movie from this side to this side and nobody moved it in the movie, they're going to let you know about it. And right? it happens all the time. Movie, <laughs> Moviemistakes.com uh, is just one of many, many things. You can't get away with anything, anything anymore. It, the internet will catch it. So <clears throat> I put the series of videos out there. I made them really, really fast. And I was not good at video editing. I didn't know anything. I used a free movie program and a, and a cheap microphone and just recorded it and threw it out there. And I said, okay, and just waited. I said, okay, come at, come at, come at me. Internet, hive mind, what do you got? You're going to, you know, they're going to club me. You know, the, the, the trolls are just going to come <laughs> at me. And instead the opposite happened where people just start calling me up going, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what's happening here? You know, because they can't, they couldn't shoot it down that quickly. And then I had subject matter experts, you know, testimonials from, you know, all branches of the military and engineers and pilots and, and air traffic controllers. They're all calling me going, yeah, you know, something about this is really bothering me. They couldn't, they couldn't shoot it down either. And they kept saying the same thing. It's like, we couldn't see the forest for the trees. Sorry, let's circle back to the spirituality part, uh, which is by about halfway through the clues, I had the Christian community coming at me in mass saying okay you're dancing around the, the the god angle too much you've got to address it one way or the other we want to know your take on it and so that's when i made the clue called they are hiding god and then i made a couple more that, that touched on that aspect and that's when people were going okay where you know that then all these christians came into the into the flat earth community and started making their own videos along it they start going through the the, the bible um mostly the king james i think uh with a fine tooth comb and going chapter and verse trying to find what what was going on to where uh, my favorite website still out there is from a guy named rob skiba who made a, a, a website called testingtheglobe.com and he said yeah there's only one verse one 
Mm -hmm. the, the touches on it, you guys know what it is probably already, Isaiah 4022, he who sitteth, sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Well, circle isn't globe, it's not sphere, it's not ball, it's circle. Your dinner plate is circular, your dining room table, hubcaps, it could be two-dimensional. And he goes, he goes, it's really weird because I'm talking with more and more pastors that are holding on to Isaiah 4022 like it's got veto power over the rest of the Bible. And that's when it occurred to me as, as this, the, we'll end this part with this. When I hit this, that, that part, when, when all the, the Christian community came up, you know, and, and as a, as a big cohesive group and said, yeah, the Bible is, a, is, is flat. That's when all of a sudden I realized the magnitude of this thing, where it's like all of a sudden there was all these people. I was getting emails from tons of, even today, tons of people saying, I, the, the, the flat earth concept brought me back into the fold, brought me back into the church. People had been away from the church for years, including me. Uh, any doubts I had, because the default shape of the flat earth model absolutely screams a creator. And sure. if there's a creator, well, you get a problem, you know, if you're anybody right. in science, because <laughs> then, you know, you're going to have to reevaluate everything. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's, that's how I got back into it to where now uh, I am, uh, I, I preach the spirituality side, I think as much as anything. I mean, yeah, I have to argue a lot of the, the technical points on a regular basis, but like I, I just did a thing with an astrophysicist down in LA where and he considers himself a Christian, which is even weirder. And we were going back and forth. I go, look, all the stories of the Bible point to one thing and one thing only. And that is it was built. It was created. And if it's that, where, where, where you, you have nowhere to stand from an astrophysics standpoint. Anyway, sorry. Mm. There you go. No, that's, no, that's fine. That's what we're looking for. Um, just as a chase, as a heads up, I'm getting a little bit of uh, getting a little bit of, of Mark coming through your mic. So I, I can hear you over. Are you Skype, sure it's Are you I'm, sure it's him? Uh, it's coming in that way through OBS. I'm oh, I kind of okay. killed it for a second, but uh, yeah, when you talk, I'm getting it through Chase's mic for some reason. So I don't uh, know. If, I may have to. Is, Chase, are you listening to it? He's listening to it through his headphones, though. Yeah. Uh, you hang on. Let me let me throw in a pair of headphones real fast. <laughs> One second. Let's see if we can get rid of it. And if we can, so, not no big deal. Yeah. So uh, to, to those watching, uh, again, Mark Sargent here with us and uh, sharing with us just how uh, encountering and discussing and exploring the idea that the, the Earth is flat kind of necessarily leads to the idea that the Earth is designed, yeah. which uh, if true, I definitely could see that I could agree with that. If the Earth is flat, then by definition, it, you can see that it is designed. Right. So what what we want to do is uh, we're going to go through some questions, okay. and uh, we just uh, uh, this is you know Chase obviously jump anything you know you can think of jump in and what we're also going to do is uh, we're going to anybody in the audience is can is free to ask any question about any topic doesn't necessarily have to pertain to flat Earth and it doesn't necessarily have to be to me or Chase it can uh, we're we're just going to do. Uh, we, we always keep that open for believers who are struggling with theological, philosophical, or uh, questions that maybe we can answer. Um, I, I don't know about you, Mark. I grew up in, uh, in a church that was very good about training us, um, but it's it's one of those things where you're embarrassed to, to ask some questions because you think everybody else has kind of got all the answers. And, oh, sure. Uh, I mean, like, like you the know? standard one um, isn't uh, – Bart Simpson, I'll, I'll use that example where Bart's at Sunday school and he says – he goes, wouldn't hell like be like a hot tub and you just get used to the heat eventually? And and the teacher goes, no. No, you wouldn't. It'd be burning forever. <laughs> like, really? Yeah. 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 Well, I had to uh, – I, 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 some, my wife knows this story, and I bet she's watching. But we we were uh, we were at a church together. No, we weren't. This is before we were we were just started dating. I had a kid in one of my churches I was serving in at seminary, and, and we were talking about the resurrection and, and how Jesus is the first fruits. And he he says uh, he says, "Wait a minute, um, Jesus Jesus is resurrected." I said, "Yeah, yeah, Jesus resurrected, like forever." Yeah, Jesus is is resurrected for forever. He sits at the right hand of the Father forever. So he's been alive for two thousand years. Yes, man, he's been alive. For, I, the minds of teenagers, man. That kid went. How long is that dude's beard? You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Like, that's a great. That's awesome. That's I don't good. know. Like, but 
<laughs> so so we always keep that a that open that AMA open for oh, anybody sure. that um, that wants to ask anything if they're in a, the the anonymity that we talked about you know it's yeah. it's good for this uh, so we've got through a couple of them already but but just as a uh, just as a not directly related to spiritual stuff just for my own curiosity um, so you, if I'm not mistaken your your particular model is the disc with the firmament the dome yes. Oh. Yeah, so it okay. would it would literally look like a shallow snow globe or a sports stadium okay. type of thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, when you mentioned the um, when you I know you talk about it in the doc they st that there's a there's a there's a moment where tons of nukes are going up into the air for no apparent reason. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's when that's when the okay we got to shut this down kind of starts being apparent. Right. Um, is that am I to understand that that is an, that uh, what whatever was NASA what kind of encountered this dome and went oh okay can we break through this and that was the goal of yeah yeah the, you know the one of the standard things of men you know men do have sort of a caveman aspect to them which is <laughs> it's like look there's a wall over there let's see if we could break through it get the cannon. Get the cannon, okay? And you know they just keep bringing up bigger and bigger cannons. It's like, yeah, we're gonna need something bigger than this. So the United States and the Soviet Union used uh, atomic weapons against whatever you know you want to call it, the firmament, the dome, uh, for four years straight. That's all they did. They fired missiles straight up for four years. And this was back in the days when atomic weapons were a pricey proposition. It wasn't, you know, you didn't get them in boxes of cereal. You know, these yeah. were really expensive. <laughs> and they were, they, the first shots were in the low megaton range. And then after the first few shots, they just used lower yield kiloton range. And I know a lot about ballistics and I know actually quite a bit about ordnance. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my things. And if you're listening, government, and uh, <laughs> I know I have to get on a plane day after tomorrow. That's going to work out well. So, uh, and that was the if you can't bust through something with a megaton, you know, with megatons, well, right. then you're not busting through it. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. At that point, you're going to have to paint the sky and figure out what the exact measurements of this thing are in terms of arc. And that's what they did, literally for four years. And then they both, United States and Soviet Union, shut it down the very same time, very same day. And they said, oh, it was a moratorium. It's like, we're just not going to do aerial bursts anymore. Really? Why? Why? <laughs> After four years, why would you just quit? Um, and, and some of their, you know, the Americans are different from the Soviets. Soviets just number things, but the Americans put creative names on their weapons packages. And yeah. most of their stuff was under the umbrella called Operation Fishbowl which I thought was a very, very interesting thing, considering they were not doing underwater shots with Operation Fish Bowls, all aerial bursts. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they, yeah, after that, that's, that, that is something that we would do. I, I absolutely, when I was, when I was thinking about it, I was going, yeah, that's what I would have done as well. And if you can't bust through it, the first couple shots, it's like, okay, what do we do? You, then you just militarize the sky. I mean, after the, it was literally after the third shot, that's when NASA was founded. Up until then, it was just the United States military. And after the third shot, NASA becomes a thing. And then within a year after that, 1959, they do two massive changes to the world. One was they announced the Van Allen radiation belts, which says that there's this super deadly band of radiation barrier thing up there. No one should ever, ever go up through it ever, even though two years later they said, oh, yeah, we're going to go through it. Uh, you know, with the Kennedy, the whole moon program. And then also in yeah. 1959 was when they ratified the Antarctic Treaty, which sealed off the outer edge and said that nobody can go out to Antarctica ever. Uh, no country, no matter how much money you have, no matter what your interests are, you cannot set up corporate shop down in Antarctica. It's the only unbreakable treaty in the history of treaties. Nobody owns Antarctica. Um, and it's bulletproof. It's not even up for debate until 2041. And nobody even protests it. That was the other thing. That was one of the tipping points for me was... Uh, why, you know, if, if I'm the owner of British Petroleum, why am I not running full page ads every freaking month in the London Times saying how, why would it be great? Well, that's because uh, somebody, all you have to do is get some guy calls up at the head of whatever industry and, and they say national security. Don't talk about it. You know, we'll, we'll compensate you. We'll do whatever, you know, whatever, but do not talk about it. If you talk about it, we will come down on you like a ton of bricks and it's worked. So it's 2019 and nobody owns, owns Antarctica. Go figure. Huh. 
Anyway, sorry, I ramble. Well, no, no, that's fine. Just uh, that was just me being curious. So, moving into the faith aspect of it, if somebody asked you, yeah. um, what is faith and how do you define it? Uh, what would you, how would you define faith? Faith. Wow, no one's ever actually asked me the definition of faith, and I'm not gonna like. I, 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 I suppose <laughs> seriously, I've done a lot of interviews. Nobody's ever asked me that. I suppose I could cheat and, and type in something, but you see my hands, so I'm not gonna cheat. <laughs> Uh, because the computer's that far away. I got you. The, um, it's, it's super far. It, it is. It, it's, it's a big computer, big monitor. I cannot reach the monitor from here. Uh, the faith. What is faith to me? The, the gut instinct that lets your personal beliefs override everything that the world tells you okay so in this case my faith would be for me uh even though the world and scientists and peer peer pressure means nothing to me it rarely has but now it literally since flat earth it means nothing to me for obvious reasons because if it did sure it, i mean i have people all the time friends family co you know, ex-co-workers they're all saying the same thing it's like you are really screwed up you know you cannot believe this Everybody knows. In fact, I'll, let me use this. Um, here's, a, here's a faith thing. Uh, I'll go the other way with this, which is uh, there's a great quote from George Orwell, the guy that wrote 1984. Uh, and he wrote this in 1946 uh, for a journal. He said, if you walked up to anybody on the street in 1946, uh, and he's talking about the, the, the responsibility of science because people believe scientists no matter what they tell them because, well, they're smarter mm -hmm. than us. Therefore, they are more credible than us. What do I know? I'm just a schmo. This guy's wearing a white lab coat. He's obviously a super genius. Right? And so in 1946, <laughs> the, the, uh, he said, if you walked up to people in the street and asked them how they knew it was a globe, their first response was immediate, which was, what are you talking about? We know. We know it's a globe. It is no uh, Game of Thrones. It is known, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and then if you push them on it, they get angry when you said, well, yeah, but how do you know? Because remember, 1946, that was 12 years before NASA. So how did everybody sure. in the world know that the world was, there was a globe in 1946 before NASA was even founded, before there was anyone even gone up high enough to even take an image, a single image? How'd they know? Yeah. They didn't know. It was what you were told. Faith is breaking out of that. Which is faith is something I, I think it's, you know, you, if you want to call it a, a, a spiritual journey, uh, being touched from the outside where the, for me, it's, it's having, again, I'm kind of winging this because I've never answered this before. It's having an aspect of God touch you that overrides everything else that the world has, has shown you up until that point. Because really, we're, we are such a blend of uh, peer pressure and things that are put on us from, you know, all forms of media and schooling. And then, but faith tends to disregard all of that. And we see a lot of the similarities with the Flat Earth Movement. People, I get that all the time where people is like, what? Science has told you. Science has shown you. I go, yeah, science has shown me a lot of things. But there's a lot of things they haven't shown me. So that's where faith comes in. I mean, it is our faith in in this system that we have, you know, been manufacturing for the last four years that has gotten us to where we are now, and it's done very well. I got you. So, uh, would you have any? Well, you, now let me, let me ask that question. That's kind of a follow up. Would you? Uh, well, let me let me just kind of. This is where we where we kind of come from. We've been we've been kind of trained and conditioned and I don't want to say trained and conditioned in the wrong way, but no, no, I mean, it's, we, it's as good as we've been. Uh, I mean, you're in an army like anybody else. So training and conditioning, right, that's right. a good enough word. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a good thing. And, uh, so when we see stuff, uh, you know, we see things in the old Testament, like God calling the people to come and reason with him. Hmm. You know, they, they, uh, they're walking away from him in a lot of different ways. And he's, you know, there, he's calling them to return, to come and see that he's not just, you know, he's, he is angry at what's happened and what they're doing, but he's not so angry that his love for them has been overridden that he says, come and re let's reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And right. yet when we see, uh, you know, how many times does God say to the people of Israel, I'm the Lord, your God who brought you out of Egypt. You know, he's, he's calling them to remember who he is, what he's done. Right. And so what I, what I find throughout scripture 
is that there is consistently God calling us to to faith, to trust, on the basis of what He has shown about Himself. Sure. And so it's almost as if there's an there's an evidence base kind of faith that that is like uh, it's a faith that's built on what you can know, as opposed to a faith that seems to override what what you're necessarily being told in some sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you see a do you see a contrast there or a problem no, with how those two things can fit together? No, I don't. Uh, as a matter of fact, it kind of reminds me of how, uh, and I think it's done deliberately, that God doesn't show us obvious miracles that be witnessed by a lot of people because it's too easy. Uh, meaning, uh, whereas science can show us minor miracles all day long, you know, and they come up with new ones every year. And that is one of the reasons why science has been doing so well for the last five centuries. And only, but I think there's a balance in everything. And I think now is sort of that time where it's, you know, this small concept, this old concept made new again, seems to be overriding all the complexities that science has created, uh, you know, again, just in the last hundred years. Uh, but, but yes, um, God reminding us of where we are, I think is a necessity. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, I think it is part of the journey. I consider this a, a wonderful, great story, you know, the world as a, as a three act, you know, play or, or however you want to call it. And we're just at the verge of act three where all the, you know, the, the big, the big song and dance number where everything gets revealed and, and, you know, <laughs> lot, a lot of music at the end and, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and then one way or the other, I mean, seriously, it, think of all the, the greatest stories are in three acts, which is you introduce the, the characters, you know, in this case, our civilization, Second act, you give them a challenge. That's what it is. And in the third act, the challenge is either resolved or it's not. One way or the other, <laughs> though, you go, you do get to the ending. You know, everything, again, not to steal too many movies, but everything the beginning has a beginning has an end, including the Bible. So, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, but I ramble. There you go. <laughs> there you go. James, I'm going to hop in with a question real quick. All right. Um, Mark, earlier when you were uh, introducing yourself, you talked about um, mm -hmm. the creation of the earth and how if if it is the disk, if it is flat, then it definitely shows it's been built. Right. Um, and then in the documentary, I think you mentioned something about us being the center of, of the universe or something like that. Right. Uh, along the those lines. I, I, may not be, uh, I may not be quoting That's okay. That's okay. perfectly there. Yeah. But – my question is, do you think that if, if the earth isn't flat or if the if it turns out that it's not or, or whatever, do you think humanity or, or the our, our, us in general lose some of that uniqueness? If it isn't flat, if it is a globe. Like, or if we fit into that model, you're talking about that science is trying to like we're just one dot in a massive universe. Oh, yeah, I do. I do think we lo lose a, a certain uniqueness because of how science has portrayed us, how they painted us. I mean, science has gone to extreme lengths to remind us again, like God reminding us, science reminds us all the time. That is their mission. That is you're nothing. You're just a tiny little speck in a universe that and you, you your significance has been reduced to zero. Uh, from their standpoint and that drives me insane because even you know even the great the, the the science oracles like Carl Sagan even he knew the universe didn't make sense it's like it just is so much wasted space it just doesn't make any sense you know how it's laid <laughs> out uh or even the um the the, the great movie that came out a couple of years ago called the principle where they introduced you know they they interviewed a lot of mainstream physicists and the mainstream physicists yeah they said we we know we have huge problems with the universe model i mean we're making up stuff now dark matter is they've been working on dark matter now for some time and they still have no idea that's like their cure-all to everything even though they can't measure it they can't detect it they can't replicate it um but yeah if it is a globe if what i'm what i'm trying to get at here is this if if it is a globe and not and not some sort of flat model uh at the very least it is a heal it is a geocentric model i do believe in that even if even if somebody okay. could prove to me and trust me i've been looking for four years you know people i've been like please shoot down the flat earth model right but even if it became a globe again for whatever reason i would go straight to geocentric meaning that the earth is the center of this particular universe uh and this, the universe would still be much much smaller 
Uh, but I don't. Okay. But again, I believe that people say, "Well, you're you're saying that God's lazy by by making you know God's all powerful. He can make a solar system and a galaxy and a universe around it." I'm going, yeah, but God is also really, really intelligent, which means he's also really, really efficient. Again, stealing a line from the movie Contact, which is <laughs> God is functioning on levels that are far more advanced than us. And if 99.99 percent of the population believes in the perception of a universe then that's all you have to build. Meaning if, if it's, I, I call it God's planetarium, right? If you can't make it to the stars up there because they're 10,000 light years away, you don't have nearly the technology to even conceivably reach something like that. And God knows this, then you don't build the stars 10,000 light years away. You just put them on the ceiling. And then it even it even makes it more interesting because then you're letting the very, very small amount of people, the, the power elite, you're letting them dictate to the population what the perception is. Then you can really get to see the you know judgment and action because it's like, really? Because you discovered what the earth really was and you lied to everybody. How do you think that's going to go down? Probably not good, <laughs> in, in my opinion. <laughs> so... Just a, I got a follow up question from Chase's follow up question. Yeah. So when, uh, when when the Genesis describes the creation of human beings that they're made, right. uh, they're not just made with form and function as as God designs, you know, a biometric machine of some kind. But right. we're, it talks about how we're made in God's image that we carry the Imago Day, yeah. and uh, that makes us different than than anything else. Yes. Do you think? Do you think that? Uh, do you think that the Imago Dei and the image of God that, that gives us our human dignity, our val our objective value, those sorts of things, is that lessened if we if we move our location or if we move uh, if we change the the model of our Earth? Is it, is is our value in any way dependent on those things? Nah, if we do, in fact, no, no, no. God's whether image? whether because man, sorry, my rides here. The um, <laughs> uh, oh oh, they're not picking me up. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, they wouldn't have no, sirens if they were picking you up. Exactly. You're right. They're, you just hear screeching of tires. <laughs> screeching of tires. I, by the way, I, I will say this. I had a friend actually put this. Uh, he made a note of it in his Facebook post. I actually have survived two federal raids, believe it or not. Uh, really? Yeah. I lived to tell the tale, uh, both for fireworks back in the day. I, remember I, I said I was in... I did. Yeah, I read about that. Yeah, you your own fireworks. yeah. But it, before before <laughs> I was into ordinance, I was into fireworks because you know I was too young to actually be into ordinance, and uh, yeah, the feds didn't like me doing that, especially on campus. I, I noticed your your shirt, Chase. Is that University of? It's Auburn University. Auburn University. Yeah, uh, I, I I on campus was uh, I I was I was at Western Washington University near the Canadian border, and that's where I got nailed. Uh, sorry, to answer your question real quick. Uh, no, it doesn't It doesn't matter where you are when you are built. So, and you're absolutely right. We are different in that capacity. Uh, stealing another movie reference, and that is every other species on this world uh, develops a natural equilibrium with its surrounding environment. Human beings do not. Uh, human beings, I think, were designed deliberately to be this weird catalyst with all these wonderful, these great highs and these great lows, and we were to figure out the balance, you know, between all of us to, uh, collectively as a balance, and of course, we've been just doing horrible things to the world. Uh, but through that, that's our challenge. That is our test. You know, remember I said act, act one through three, and that is act two in our civilization is we are... In, the challenge is, can we actually live, you know, with some equilibrium in this world and discover who we are, discover God, discover our true selves? Uh, and I don't and, and, and of course, it was going it was designed to where we were going to fall, you know, short. And then God was you know going to pick us up and say, OK, here's where you went wrong. You know, it was it was kind of like the again, another movie reference. It, it was a no win scenario. They, we were never going to win this thing. Not the, 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 the deck was always stacked against us. And as you know, uh, the, the, the devil seems to have pretty much free run of the place. So yeah. Yeah. anyway. Okay. So, uh, let me ask this question then if, uh, do you think that scripture teaches a flat earth? And if so, 
what passages would you say it's going to be found in? Oh, sure. <clears throat> okay, the ones that I, I strongly, well, the obvious ones, uh, would be uh, Genesis, you know, first chapter, you know, the firmament separating the waters above and the waters below. That would just be a, a one just physical aspect of it. But the stories that I love, and you're going to have to quote me, you're going to have to do, look up the chapter and verse on your own because I don't have them memorized. Uh, okay. The ones that I love more than most, uh, one would be the story of Joshua, where he asked God to hold the sun and the moon in the sky for an extra day so he could slay more... I don't know which ites they were, but they were big and really Canaanites. Were they Canaanites? <laughs> well, I mean, everybody was a Canaanite. Oh, okay. So well, okay. We'll say the, we'll say the Canaanites. Uh, but but and from that, so you're saying, well, that doesn't prove a flat Earth. I go, well, think of it this way: the physics again. Remember, God is more efficient. The physics of shutting down. Really, they're coming back. The um, <laughs> Uh, the, the the physics. I know you think I live in like New York or something because there's but there's a highway like right behind her. So uh, Joshua asking to have the sun and the moon held in the sky for an extra day is way easier if it's just a planetarium. Then you're just literally hitting the pause button and the light show that is the sun and the moon and the stars. They're just holding in place. Nothing's happening from an astrophysics standpoint. If it is an actual solar system. Do you keep the the amount of modifications that you would have to do are are epic. I mean, you have to shut down the whole movement of the solar system. You have to shut the, down the rotation of the sun. You have to shut down the rotation of the moon, the the orbits, all the orbits simultaneously, and then you've got to compensate uh, with all the gravitational forces. I mean, the centrifugal force alone, just stopping the world the water i mean you've seen 2012 the movie if it was a globe model the you would create tsunamis instantly which would wipe out uh, almost everything it is way way easier way way easier in a planetarium it's literally just hit pause and that's it i mean it's what we would do in a planetarium now i mean that's what they do all the time it's like they pause the moon to show people things it's like okay you notice the waxing crescent here you know and they hit pause and that's all, that's all you have to do um the my favorite one though has got to be, and I know this is going all the way back to Genesis, is the Tower of Babel, which is, and I know I didn't say it, I did that deliberately to tease, you know, I, I wanted to, <laughs> to, I wanted to make sure people knew, and I, I all these people emailed me, you're talking about the Tower of Babel, aren't you? It's like, yes, I'm talking about the Tower of Babel, thank you for picking up on that. It was so blatant, uh, which was... The, uh, the Tower of Babel would have been the, you know, what spire, you know, you're creating basically a bridge to heaven, right? Well, if the world is spinning at a thousand miles an hour at the equator and it's going around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour, then that spire is always in motion. It's not going anywhere. It's always moving. So how exactly is it connecting to heaven? How is this bridge actually happening? Well, if it's stationary, then it's going only to one place. That is straight up. I don't know where geographically this thing would have been on the map. I mean, actually, if it was the Middle East, it would have been pretty close to the center, actually. And going straight up. And that's why it was such a problem for God. And again, remember, the rest of the story, which, again, if you'd watch the clues, I thought was even more. I extrapolated, which was, you know, God saw this going on and going, yeah, they're going to make it. That's not good. You know, we, we, we <laughs> can't, can't make it. And, you know, and so that's why, you know, intervening. You know, changing the languages. I don't know if the tower was actually torn down in mid thing or if he just let it rot because it's like, well, if they can't figure out the engineering stuff because they screwed up their languages. Plus, he dispersed them all over the place. But the point was he made them whoever it was, whoever the civilization was, was too good. They were too might as well have been uh, like the Atlanteans or the the Anunnaki or who, whoever you want to call them whoever this first civilization was or one of the early civilizations was very very adept at what they they didn't have enough problems they teams seem to be too unified as a as a people and let's face it uh human beings even our civilizations if there was use the Reagan threat from the 80s where he said if all of a sudden there was some outside threat we would all unify no one would go, go to war again so Anyway, uh, another small one. Uh, I'll, let me end on this one because I know you probably got tons of questions. Which is um, one of my favorites, which is Werner von Braun's headstone, which I loved so much. Uh, I didn't figure it out myself. Somebody else found it for me and sent it to me. Uh, Werner von Braun's headstone, you know, the, the, the Nazi scientist who became the founder of NASA. Uh, it says the year he was born, the year he died, and it says Psalms 19.1. 
and I didn't know what Psalms 19 was. I had to look it up. I'm going, why does he have so he sent, why does a rocket scientist have a Bible verse on his headstone? And it says, and the firmament shows his handiwork. And I thought that was very interesting because of all the things that Werner von Braun shouldn't be talking about, it shouldn't be some sort of physical barrier that he was punching through on a regular basis with the Apollo program and Mercury and Gemini. So what was he talking about? Was he reaching beyond the grave? That's what I think. Mm. So, and, and there's all sorts of smaller things. In, in If anyone that wants to look it up, go to testingtheglobe.com. But you know a lot of them. The earth is fixed. The earth is immovable. How many times has that been said? The earth hangs on nothing. Um, okay. I can't remember the God's footstool reference. Um, or how about, uh, here's, uh, sorry, one more quick one would be a side one when the, um, uh, the devil took, uh, Christ up on top of the highest point and show and tried to tempt him with the entire world simultaneously. And they were very specific about that saying he could see everything from this point. Well, how can you see everything from a globe? Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. Let's throw one more in here. The most obvious, duh. It didn't, didn't even occur to me uh, because it's not as interesting as a story. And that is uh, the second coming, which is they say every eye shall see him simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that does not work on a globe to where I even had a guy call in on a radio show and said, Look, well, how that's going to be pulled off is because the, everybody on the other side of the globe will have smartphones. And I go, uh, that kind of lessens the impact of the whole thing. <laughs> you know, when you see, if you see Christ on a little five inch screen or a tablet, it just doesn't have that same oomph that if, you know, it's if kind you're of anticlimactic. Look, yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> at that point, people are probably questioning. It's like, Ooh, what show is this? Is this on HBO? What is this on? <laughs> Seriously, is this a new series? They would, they wouldn't know. So yeah, there are, it, seriously, it's got, it got to the point where literally, Everybody that was that was into Bible prophecy or anyone that was a Bible literalist were going into this saying, okay, find me a verse other than the 4022 that even hints that it's a globe. Everything else points to some sort of flat, enclosed structure. Okay. So there you go. So, so uh, just do some some of those follow-ups real quick. Chase has been has been uh, keeping up for us in the chat. Yeah. The uh, in terms of the Joshua 10, the stopping of the sun. Right. So one of the questions I get a lot of time as uh, well, I say a lot of the times, one of the questions that I get from, how do I say this the right way? Uh, one of my professors called them Starbucks atheists, like the ones who, <laughs> who've read an article and oh, right, right. now they're, they're, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Chase knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Fast food atheists. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. Uh, one of the questions that's pretty consistent with me is uh, how can you believe given what we know about, uh, what's the uh what's the word it's biology but it's uh ocean what's my, oceanography my brain is not, that and uh Microbiology? geology archaeology uh, hydrology uh, it's <laughs> by, by uh, ocean animals ocean study of ocean animals ology uh no, we'll just say we'll just say oh marine but marine biology Thank you. Marine is the word I could yeah, not yeah, think no, of. Okay. Thank you. That was gonna, that was just, That's all right. It still falls under biology, but go ahead. What we know about <laughs> marine biology. Based on what we know from marine biology, how can you believe that Jonah was actually swallowed by a whale or great fish and survived and lived three days to tell about it? Right, and, you right, know, right, all right. that's and generally the answer is, wait a minute. OK, let's let's. Let's back up here for a second. Are you granting me Genesis one one? Are you are you granting me granting me creation ex nihilo? Because if you give me Genesis one one, then it is within the realm of possibility that Jonah is the one that swallowed the whale. <laughs> you know, right. that is that is that is a lesser miracle than creation out of nothing. And so I guess my in terms of the Joshua passage, and and you're dealing with a being who can who can take nothing and speak it and make it something. Right. Uh, is it, is there actually any functional difference of difficulty between hitting a button and actually stopping the rotation, actually stopping those sorts of things? Does that does that affect that idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At all when it does. It, power into we're not talking about. Oh boy, now we're kind of getting into the superhero superhero power argument, which is <laughs> if God is all powerful, does God care about using levels of power like that? And it does. It does circle back to the efficiency argument. Um, not to use here. I'll use a, I'll use a computer one, and I know, you know we're not going to delve into the simulation thing too much because we're we're talking sure. Bible here. But the we've in the simulation world, it doesn't matter how powerful computers get. The load, what we do when we write programs, it's always maximized for efficiency. Mm 
So yes, mm -hmm. in a game, for example, I don't know if you guys play any games, but as you know, I used to play a few games. Yeah, we do. Um, <laughs> every game is maximized for efficiency. It doesn't matter how powerful your computer is. So if, for example, we and we we like uh, a term I came up with is like flashlight graphics, which if you're walking around in a game with flashlights, right? You're only, it's only illuminating what the flashlight shows and what's behind you is not being rendered in the slightest. Mm -hmm. um, how does that apply to Joshua? God is extremely efficient. There's no reason for God. Remember, if, if the people, okay, sorry, let me jump back to the game thing real quick, which is in the gaming world. Look, I, I used to develop a little bit. Mm -hmm. In the gaming world, if you know your character is never going to be on the other side of that mountain, do you draw the other side of the mountain? No, you do not. Why? Because he's never going to be there. So why would you draw it? You're mm -hmm. just wasting energy. You're wasting power. You're wasting resources. And that's what we're talking about here, conservation of resources. If the characters in this world, us, we'll use a comparison, are never ever going to make it to that star up there because it's, ten, we'll just say 10 light years away right? Which is apparently close in astrophysics. 10 years away, do you actually build that star in the solar system? Nope. No, nope. why would you? You're just way, they're never going to get there. All you have to do is show them that it's up there and let them figure it out. Remember, we were the ones, not to, not to use a glib comment, but God made the sun and the moon, but it was NASA that told us how big they were and how far they were away. God didn't say anything about that. So that, that, all the scientists were the ones that defined it and said, oh, yeah, here's exactly what they are. And here's their makeup. And here's the, the blast furnace that's inside them. And all these amazing, and we're going to build, we're going to extrapolate everything around that. Um, sorry, uh, let me go off on a quick little tangent, which is science. The, one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard in my life was when Neil deGrasse Tyson said that science is true whether or not you believe in it. Right? And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level? Yeah, I'm totally there with you because I can test that. You want to tell me what the core of the Earth looks like? Duh, not so fast. Because remember, the core of the Earth is supposedly 4,000 miles straight down. The deepest hole ever drilled by us, by the Germans and the Russians, is 8 miles. That's mm -hmm. uh, barely a fraction of 1%. And yet you go and show me these beautiful cross-section artist renderings with red and orange and yellow and white bands. And then you show me the same freaking cutaway of Jupiter and Neptune and Saturn. It's like, you don't even have things on there. And you're showing me the cross-sections of this. How are you doing all this? <laughs> so, no, no, I'm sorry. When it comes to the Joshua story, it's easy because God is, would be, I'm not saying that God is lazy. I'm saying that God is really, really efficient. If God knows full well that he doesn't have to draw out the other stuff for you because you're not getting there. So it's like, as long as you believe what you see up there, great, fantastic. And people say, well, you're saying that God's lying. I'm, no, I'm saying God is testing you. God is challenging you. And some of the people that figure it out as part of this test, they're lying to you as well because they want to retain their power, which is a whole other question. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... So there's a there's a presupposition that I'm hearing that I kind of want to question just a little bit, sure. and what what I think it keeps coming back to um, is this idea of efficiency, right. on the basis of how we can interact with with whatever it is that's being created. So the idea of that this star is up here, um, and it's projected, it's not actually made because God knows we're never going to get there, and so He's going to be efficient about making this, sure. and it's going to be a it's a projection and not an actual thing because He knows we're never going to actually get there right um do, do you think that that carries a presupposition about us being the primary uh character in the story as opposed to what if uh what if god is both efficient and yet god is a is indeed an artist and the universe exists to you know as paul talks about that the the uh, the heavens are the very thing that that show him that he is he sh it shows us who god is right. it shows right, us right. that he exists and and his greatness and so what is it possible that that star actually exists and it is 10 10 you know 10 light years away or like when we talk about the observable universe that we can see that we can we start wrapping our heads around right the the distances and that may i mean if if the universe exists to glorify god and to show how good and awesome he is right. that it would make sense that he would make something like that as opposed to it being about us being the central figures. Does that, does that question make sense? Yeah, it does. And in, in my opinion, I can't speak for all flat earthers, obviously. 
Uh, first off, we are the main characters. Uh, no, no question. You you said earlier that we are the unique life form here. Uh, and come on, let's face sure. it. If you pulled us out of this off this stage, the world would run just fine forever. <laughs> no one would ever have any problems. Yeah, forest fire would happen here, and occasionally some species would screw up and eat some other species. But for the most part, everything would work would work just fine. Um, as far as building a star system ten thousand light years away, yes, of course you could build it if you wanted to. But you wouldn't because it's a, again, it's a waste of energy. Even God, it's like, well, God has is limitless power. It's like, yeah, God doesn't necessarily want to exert himself if he doesn't have to. Because remember, it, with, with that extra power, you could build more worlds. But that's a whole other thing. Let me, let, me, let me take it to another direction real fast. There are clues okay. here that even science has figured out recently that really, really hint towards what I was saying, where, whereas you don't build something that far away. Uh, one would be the notorious uh, double slit experiment, the the most recent one being the single electron gun experiment done, I think it was about 15 years ago. And if you guys don't know what the double slit experiment is, it goes, it goes into the simulation side, which is in the simulation world, we don't render things if no one's looking at it. So mm -hmm. if a person's mm -hmm. running around a game, if you're, again, i uh, use the simple version. If you're in area A, running around, you can see everything in area A. Area B is absolutely black. There's nothing happening in, in area B. It is a mathematical computation. There is nothing being rendered there ever, right? And you say, okay, what's the point? Mm -hmm. My point is when scientists accidentally, because they didn't plan, they don't plan on most of their things, when they accidentally did a single electron gun experiment in 2005, they started running into the same thing here, where we are right mm -hmm. now. Uh, and if you're saying, that sounds like a plot to the movie, I go, yeah, it was 13th floor, 1998, which was, <laughs> that, I mean, it's an, it's an old, and that was based off a, of a German movie called World on a Wire from 1975, which was based on a book called Simulcron 3 from the 1960s. Ever since we started creating machines, we've kind of hinted at that. But the single electron gun basically says that if I'm not looking at that banner behind me, it's not being rendered at the molecular level. And we can see this with every time that we we, uh, we put an observation on it. It was an accident. All of a sudden, they started looking at things, and every time they turned around, the test changed. And so they finally put a camera, you know, a dedicated camera on the particular test. And as the camera's watching it, now it's rendering correctly. And when they turn the camera off, it doesn't render correctly. And they're like, and what that says is, is that we are we are the functional character here yes are is it for the glory of god of course what, what, what's the method behind it oh take your pick uh you know um we're, we're only here for one of three reasons though which is um either um entertainment right and i'm not going to say exactly for who but if it's, it can't be necessarily entertainment for us because there's a lot of people not having a good time well, let's face it the world is <laughs> we again stealing a movie reference uh human beings tend to define the reality through misery and suffering uh the other two options one would be confinement but it doesn't feel like a prison either because it's a very beautiful prison very well laid out and there are there are some wonderful things here whereas prison for our formal prison is supposed to be miserable most of the time just barely tolerable. <laughs> it kind of feels like school, it, you know, which is kind of a hybrid of both. When you're in school, you're kind of confined, but it's kind of fun. But sometimes it's not. But most of the time, you're there to learn stuff. You're supposed to. You're supposed to be learning something, and that's what I feel it, it, it is for us. And who knows? May, again, I'm not going to try to get into the mind of God, but it feels like you know God is is getting something out of this as well. I don't know what. Exactly. You know, maybe it's a reality show that for him that, you know, he, even though he knows the future, maybe he's hidden the future from himself. You know, is that he's like watching us. But again, I'm I'm speculating. It's uh, it's it's an interesting place, but it feels like a giant journey for for all of us and that we're supposed to learn. So I'm going to have to ask Chase for this reference here. Chase, who was it? Um, you know, your Chase is the is the, the primary theologian. Uh, ah. who, who is the uh, who is the guy that said the chi the he talked about the chief end of man? Oh, great! No, I, I, my my brain. <laughs> the is chief dead, end have... of man. The chief end of man. It was a Christian theologian. He said the uh, chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Hmm. Uh, 
Would you agree with that? And how would that? I would uh, but, very briefly. How would that fit into your? Oh your yeah, model? yeah. I know. I would. I. I. That's a. It's a nice idea on paper. <laughs> it's. It's a great <laughs> concept. Uh, however, as you know, uh, human beings are a surly, miserable bunch that tends to screw up stuff the first chance they get. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that's again I I think but how can you how can you really enjoy the glory of anything without seeing its opposite? And I know it sounds kind of like a cop out, but it's true. How do you know uh, cold without hot, pain without pleasure, feast without famine? How do you know what a true glory is? I mean, that's if you want God to make his 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 great appearance, now would be a good time <laughs> because we've we've augured this thing almost into the ground. <laughs> and but and but through that, I mean, let, let's let's face it through the, the, the great journeys, the great stories have amazing valleys that the antagonists have to climb out of or get help to get out of. You know, it's at those it's at that lowest point where which makes it all worth it. I, I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm a big writer by by uh, it's one of my natural things. I got you. I got you. Uh, so. Moving on to another passage of scripture, uh, Revelation chapter twenty-one. Yeah. Uh, we have this discussion of the uh, the creation of the new heaven, the new earth. Mm -hmm. Like the Revelation of John is about uh, Christ is returning; he is coming to to fix all the stuff that we have so wantonly messed up. Sure. Um, and, I mean, we, even I would go so far as to say that you know, when when Christ talks about the kingdom of God and how uh, whoever wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of God has to become like a servant. And uh, I mean, that just, that's just so absolutely backwards <laughs> from what we perceive of as success uh, in our, in our world and in our culture, what we as humans think of success as rising above everybody else. When in the kingdom of God, Jesus says to be greater is to be lower, to be a servant. And uh, he's coming to, to fix all of this. When it talks about new heaven, new earth, uh, what does that look like in terms of the flat earth model? How do you see a new heaven, a new earth, if the earth is as uh, as you believe it to be? I believe that the new heaven and new earth would be for me what's what's happened in the past and will happen again. And by that, I mean, most even most of mainstream scientists realize that we're not the first people to rent this apartment, not by a long stretch. And, and the Bible talks about civilizations previous to ours and what, what has happened. I think there is, we'll, we'll use a, a sci-fi term, you know, not necessarily a biblical term, which is terraforming, which is between civilizations, I think God makes tweaks and adjustments to his liking. You know, which is okay. We're gonna we're gonna move the continents here and there. These people worked out pretty good. I don't know about these people so much. You know, and 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 during that time, then history is there's a break in history, which which I also think is necessary because each group I feel that every civilization has to go through their own journey themselves and have to learn through it. Now, of course, the only reason they got there in the first place is because God tweaked that group and the group before and who knows maybe you know maybe he saves some um, I, I shouldn't get into too much of the revelation thing you know maybe he <laughs> saves some of the good parts it's like all right these guys they they're on the stick here but we can't have them you know we're gonna have to spread them a little thinner here and i mean who knows it it just feels to me that when new heaven and new earth it's not just an, it's not a unique thing or uh, a profound thing. It, it just happens every so often. And maybe that's what he calls it, new, a new heaven and new earth. Uh, but as far as the end to our story, yes, I do believe, yes, there'll be a wonderful new heaven. He'll come in and tweak things around. And 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 I, I do believe, and again, you'll have to quote me the, the, the verse, you know, the, the, the new golden, 21. The, the, new go yeah. the new golden age where, you know, we're last for what, another thousand years. There, there's your there's your wonderful place and then at the end it's like okay time to time to start again and what happens to us at that point pff, uh, i'm hoping good things hmm. so follow-up question yeah. then if the uh what i'm hearing you say is that the second coming functions a lot like an earth reset like uh we're going to start this back over and we're going to make some tweaks to it yeah. and see what happens this time around um and if there is a break in history, which means that our not only are not only are we hitting the reset button on this, but we're we're also 
we're, we're kind of wiping the save file and we're <laughs> we're starting over. I mean, it's still uh, it's still there from God's standpoint, but the sure. next yeah, yeah, the yeah. next civilization, it, not to use a, an old metaphor, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. Meaning it's re it's too easy for people to lean on ancient history if they know it's absolute fact rather than say legend or myth. We've all heard about like Atlantis and Bimini Road and the continent of Mu and I mean heck, there's even books of the Bible that weren't canonized, which are really interesting. I'm I'm looking at Enoch and Jasher and uh, there's another one. Oh, the the Testament of Solomon, which we we'll get into another another time. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> seriously, um, here's a, here's a here's a quick one for you, which would be um, uh, the, the Jasher story. Uh, or sorry, the Enoch story, where in Jasher, and I believe, again, I'm going to butcher this, I know it, which is the end of the third chapter of Jasher, where he's leaving, right? He's going to walk off, the, to walk to the edge of the earth and leave that way, which is interesting because you can't do that on a globe. And when he gets to the edge of the earth and all his followers, he's got all these people following him, he's got throngs, you know, they're saying, oh, mm -hmm. don't leave. You know, it's like a, a Grateful Dead thing. You know, they're following, they're following him. He's going, look, you're not going to be able to follow me. We're going to get out to a really horrible place. And they were really specific when they got to the end of chapter three. They said he got to a place of ice and snow and more ice and more snow. Well, as you know, most of your biblical things, uh, stories happen in the desert. <laughs> a lot of desert references, <laughs> palm trees and dates and camels and cows and whatever else they got. They don't talk about a lot of snow and ice. And that's supposedly, and yeah, when he got to that point, nobody could follow him, and they got to this part, the 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 end of the world, and was taken up, and that was and that was it. So where was I going with this? I am not sure. Other than, <laughs> uh, other than, but there's changes after each, even the even those stories that were breaks in in the history, you know, and and those weren't even canonized books, and yet they still hang around, which I thought was interesting. Oh, by the way, if you, if, for those out there that were looking for interesting stuff, reread the Book of Enoch. <laughs> in a flat earth context it makes way more sense way more sense because remember it's a tough read and it's all mechanical you know where the winds are kept and the rain is kept and the snow is kept and and, and it's all like this this giant mechanical system up there because remember enoch was up there for decades if i'm not mistaken anyway uh, the, uh, we're talking about the enoch of the of the genesis account he's He's here and then he's not, and God, and, you know, God took him so he wouldn't die. Is what we're is kind of what we're told, right? Uh, but I guess that's the, that's actually kind of helpful, but it's not exactly where I was going to go with that. My my question is is that that break in history right. becomes an issue or a problem for me because when I what I read in scripture is that uh, that Christ died, Christ was offered once for all, that he he gave himself to God once for all for all mankind. Sure, that the work of Christ is an irrepeatable event. Um, is it the case then that the work? I mean, if God, if we take Scripture seriously, it's that Jesus says there's there's one way to God, and it's through me. Right. You know, I'm the only way, um, and it's this work is an absolute indispensable thing. It's an absolute necessity. Right. Uh, with a break in history, if we take the break in history to be it to as a serious thing, and in, in what sense does the next civilization know of the Savior? And if and if that's the case, is it? If Christ has to come and do this again, and what in what sense is it once for all? It seems like we're, that puts you in a place, or, or that puts us in a place where we have to deny one portion of Scripture over and either not, it wasn't once for all. Not necessarily. Or... Uh, I, I know where you're going with this. Not necessarily a conflict. Meaning, technically speaking, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, from a from our civilization standpoint, he he laid down for it, and everyone in our civilization is bound to that in in one way or the other. Um, what happens with the next civilization? Don't know. It hasn't been written yet, at least from our standpoint. So, sure. I mean, not not to, again, not to sound glib. It's like, well, it sounds like a sequel to me. And at that point, <laughs> it's like, okay, what you know, what what happens? But it doesn't. It doesn't matter because our civilization transitions off. So whoever comes in after, it, not to say that it's their problem and not ours, mm -hmm. but it's their problem. And, you know, at that point, if if Christ is, you know, has to make another appearance, you know, and, and do that, who knows? Maybe that's his role. I, I hate to say it, but, you know, maybe that's it's and I, I know you say that it's not repeatable. 
and and yes and no from our civilization standpoint no it's not repeatable it happened once and then our civilization ends he makes his you know his second appearance and roll credits but after that you know maybe not Wow. Okay, I'm gonna steal a movie reference, and again, uh, this is, <laughs> you, you guys, you, you'll you'll know where I'm coming with here, which was the whole because I mean there was some parallels, which was the whole Neo, you know, the story of Neo, mm -hmm. which was when they got to the architect, the architect, uh, yeah. you know, he he said, you know, I like to count from 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 one version of you to the next, and at this point, we've already done this six times. And and he doesn't Neo doesn't even realize the ramifications of this. He he's like all he cares. I care about Trinity. I'm gonna go save her. But for me, I saw that as going. Oh, I see. So it is repeatable. But since nobody knows it, it's not repeat. It's it's unique f per civilization, and nobody knows, eh, including Neo in that case. But that leads into a whole other series of questions, which I don't even want to touch with a 10 foot pole because then you're talking about you know then you're talking about resetting christ himself but since he was the son of god god can do anything he wants you're asking me questions sure. that i have never really even thought about until just now <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad for that that's what we yeah, wanted to do, so you know? that's that's and that's that's what they hinted at with this and you know what i'm going with that which is in this case yes it is a one-time deal but it's also a one-time deal for whoever's whoever the next version of us is, because remember, remember, we we end. God keeps going, sure. and yeah, well, of course, you know, heaven and a wonderful thing. But God likes his routines. I I don't know. Again, I'm I'm taking a taking a guess here. Sorry if he's listening. Shot in the dark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess my my question is more based on the. Uh, I could see how, I could see how you could get to that in the sense of. Here, this civilization sacrifice and this civilization sacrifice. Uh, I guess my struggle with that is that theologically speaking, when we start talking about the Trinity and we start talking about the the ontology of of God, the divine, the single divine ontology of God, that right. the Son is the same as the, same, okay, the Son is the in, same in, being. In which as case, the Father, it wouldn't you know? it would change my answer only a little. Which is okay. Then, which case, it, Christ remembers everything. And he just uh -huh. has to go through the same routine and not let on that, uh, that oh, yeah, by the way, they were older versions of, of this world. Oh, no, that's – okay, I, I see where you thought I was going. That's, that's, so that's, that's not, not where you're going? That, no, 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 that's not what I'm thinking. Oh, okay. What I'm thinking is is um, <laughs> the idea of the crucifixion is that because Christ is God, the – the what's the right way to say this? Like when mankind sins – we we owe a debt in a sense, like the way a, a criminal owes a debt to society right. once they commit a crime, and they they pay that debt off by doing you know fines, service, right. jail time, whatever that is. Right. When they when they've paid that fine off, that's when their debt to society is paid. Well, sin creates a debt between us and God, and it's a because of who God is. You know the 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 sin itself is infinitely. Uh, it's infinitely offensive because it's it's because of who is offended. Ah. You know, if somebody said to me, you know, James, you're just you, James, you're stupid. Well, I'm just James. That's not very offensive. But if you if you said that to somebody else who's a lot more influential, who who holds an office of respect that I don't necessarily hold, it becomes a different sort of offense ah. based on who you're offending. Uh, when you're talking about offending the creator of the universe. That's kind of a big deal. And so when you talk about what does it take to pay that debt off, not just for me, but for every person that's ever lived, right. that's a that's a infinite sacrifice that has to be made. And so in what sense, why would Christ have to suffer twice to make a, a infinite payment if he's done it once? And if so, if he does have to suffer to make two infinite payments, which doesn't really add anything to it, how does, how does that all right, do? All right, all right. I'll, I'll give has, you... I'll give you another answer. I know where you're going now. Okay. Because uh, I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to, well, I'm trying to get to the next question because I know you want to resolve this one oh, way fine. or the other, which is I, what if, <laughs> uh, what if our civilization was the only one bad enough that it required that sort of sacrifice? Meaning every other civilization up until now, I mean, the sunken city is off of Japan, the sunken city is off of India, uh, the Bosnian pyramids, whoever else is out there was made in such a way that there wasn't a a conflict that ended in a massive sacrifice 
Mm-hmm. And in which case, then I again, I don't know what happens after us, but but mm-hmm. I'll, I'll let you off the hook. And which is before us, the sins apparently weren't maybe they weren't that great. I mean, think about it. even the Babylon uh, group, the Tower of Babel. I don't think they actually were sinning, really. They were, or, or were they? You know, were they just trying to get to God to meet them? You know, maybe they they were so arrogant. I mean, and yes, an arrogance is a sin, but look what they were trying to do. It's like, yeah, let's get up there. You know, is, were they were they committing the atrocities that we commit uh, basically on a yearly, you know, every year? Oh, it's terrible. I mean, I would, I could see where you're coming from with that. Yeah. Um, would it change your perspective of the Tower of Babel if, uh, so my understanding of this as I've read it yeah. is that there's a command that comes out from God, right. go and fill the earth, right. like go spread out, fill the earth with, with people. Right. And what they do is, as they say, you know, instead of that, <laughs> let's build one city, hang out together, and then we'll build a huge tower. And so it's not necessarily that God is responding to, hey, they're building a tower. This is a, this is a big deal. It's that God is responding to, they are they are not obeying this command that I've I've given them to go and spread out. And so if yeah. they're not going to do it on their own, fine, I'll just give them different languages and that'll make it happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> that one's, it is a little tricky because we're, of course, we don't know the initial commandments, you know, they were, were handed down to them because, you know, this was really, really early in the scripture. So sure, yeah. were they, were, were they following the, were they kind of skirting around the letter of the law? Did they not understand it? Or were, again, remember they were unified. That was the big thing, the, the big problem. Right. Or were they so single focused? Because I, I do believe that, that again, I do believe that God makes adjustments here and there and fine tunes things. And, and, and I hate to use the term to you guys that God is a programmer, but we didn't invent code. Meaning, you know, before we had computers, we always said, oh, God works with a magic camera and chisel and, you know, everything's glowing. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, there are complex. I mean, the way we were built, I mean, our DNA alone, I mean, what it took to build that was pretty amazing. So, you know, who knows? Maybe that maybe that first group was so simple, single purposed and single minded Mm -hmm. that. He, he just realized, like, oh, yeah, I didn't make it nearly complex enough. They're, they're just going to keep doing that. Yeah, that's not going to work. And, again, they, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, what, what's the answer? Oh, I don't know, multiple languages. Ah, yeah, that works. And they, they go from there. So, I don't know. Hey, what else you got? <laughs> Chase, do you want to get in on some of this? Or you got anything uh, in your mind? Well, yeah, I've got the, the question you and I have talked about that I was going to that I was gonna ask beforehand. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Mark, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. you... James told me you kind of mentioned this when y'all talked earlier, yeah. but the uh, kind of take it change direction a little bit and go back towards the model, the flat Earth oh, model, sure. and things like that. The old, uh, the old Jewish model of the the of what they thought the Earth looked like or what the universe looked like right. s- seems to be very similar to the model that that you promote. Right. Do y'all take? Uh, I don't know the best way to ask this, but is it? Is it based on on a model like that? Does it take, or does it take inspiration from that, or do you think maybe they got it right and we lost it, and then we're getting it back? Uh, you know? I, I, a little of all of or the all the all, all the them. above, um, which yeah. is every culture. I've got a wonderful uh, sheet, and you guys can you can look it up. You can say ancient depictions of the you know the world in Google, and but I've got a, a wonderful sheet, and they all basically drew the same thing. Uh, movie reference. Uh, would be when in Close Encounters, when all the people drew the same Devil's Tower image, everyone was focused all you know, all over the place. Why and, and and the scientists couldn't figure it out. They keep looking. It's like why do people keep drawing drawing this or making sculptures or whatever it is? Uh, in the case of Flat Earth, it was as simple as that's what they perceived. Meaning, you know, you watch the sky at night. I mean, that's really where it started. It's like the stars are moving across the sky. Well, if the stars are moving, then you immediately just start drawing, you know, what you see. Now, it's interesting that they all drew circles, though, more than anything. They drew circles with a dome under, uh, over the top of it. Now, who knows? Maybe it was the natural process of if you see the sky m- moving in a certain kind of arcing pattern, it's like, well, okay, well, we'll draw the arc first. And then, you know, underneath it, then it's, well, it's got to be some sort of circular. Um, interesting though, that you'd mentioned that, that the, the ancient Hebrews and the Egyptians, the Mayans and the Norse and the Navajo, they all drew the same freaking thing. And then they all had, were forced to abandon it simultaneously 
by the um, uh, by the global model. You know the the and which, which is interesting because when I made the clues, I understood it, and I also think that was a divine inspiration as well, being that as long as it remains in the public's eye as a snow globe or a terrarium, whatever, there's an edge. And that poses a very interesting problem to God, which is because human beings have insatiable curiosity. We love a mystery. And if, as long as that edge is out there, even in their heads, even if they don't have the technology to reach it, I, I, the joke I used to tell to people is, let's say you're the king of France in 1500 and somebody shows you the snow globe version of the world. And they say, it's absolutely true. What are you going to do about it? You have wooden wooden ships and you have horses. That's all you have. You do not have the technology to fully explore it. But eventually, you will. Sooner or later, you're going to figure it out. So what do you do? With plenty of time to spare, and I do believe God had a, had a say in this, which was that God introduces the globe model because it is brilliant in its design that it basically removes the fence. It removes the edge. There is no edge. You're, you're never going to make it to the end of the world because there is no end of the world. You're just going to go round and round and round and round. You're never going to make it. And that was enough for 99% of the people. And literally, it lasted a long, long time up until 1960. And when the government kind of was looking at the old maps going, <coughs> yeah, I don't know. There's something fishy going on. And, but even they weren't sure. Even they almost gave up in 1954 because they were, they were flying a lot in Antarctica and they're going, ah, there's nothing out there. We, we can't find it. And then during Operation Deep Freeze, they found it. And that's when they locked everything down. So, sorry, long-winded answer to what your thing was saying. Um, do I think that the, the Hebrews and everybody else, do, do I think they were, were told this or shown this or did they just observe this? Yes. And was it lost? Yes. Uh, but I think it was lost deliberately because okay. it was it was too it was too much for us. Uh, the real quick, I'll, I'll end with this, which is, uh, human beings, what what what, uh, what you were saying earlier, uh, human beings are very, very different from any other species. You put any other species in a thousand acre wildlife preserve, they are going to be happy as clams. They, you know, they've got food, they've got water, it's beautiful, wonderful. You put a human being in that same, you put 10 human beings in a thousand acre wildlife preserve, they're not going to care. All they are going to think about is the fence. They are going to stand by the fence all day long. They're going, why is the fence there? Who built the fence? Why are we on this side? Is there something on the other side? Have we angered the builders of the fence? We should start a new religion that has to do with this fence. And it just will never, ever end. Somebody sacrifice some of those animals. They're not doing anything to the fence. That's all they're going to do. And that's just 10 people. People hate being, hate confinement. They do. And so you just remove the confinement. It's, it's brilliant in its design. And by the way, while I was doing the thought experiments, while I was looking at how this world was built, again, trying to put myself in the mind of God, which is tough. There were so many cool design features of this place that just screamed, not just screamed intelligent design, but screamed perfect efficiency. I mean, little things, I'll throw just one out at you, uh, which would be the addition of 3% salt solution to make the oceans um, undrinkable by humankind. You're saying, why would that make a difference? Because if it's undrinkable, that limits your exploration. It slows humanity down by 90 something percent because you can't drink the water that you're sailing on because most of your early explorations were built on how much fresh water you could take with you. And that was just a simple, simple thing. Just 3% salt solution. Marine life, great. There's your marine thing, by the way. Marine life, great. Uh, but, but nobody else can drink it. Mammals can't drink it. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's flawless in that design. And it slows everything down. You know, the, I think part of the goal here is to get a civilization to slowly understand where they are, to slowly realize their place in the universe. A uh, very small universe. And during that process, you, you try to make that, you know, just little tweaks here and there that, that keep things from, from being too fast, like the Tower of Babel. Sorry, go ahead. Hmm. Okay. Well, to, to follow up on that, uh, talking about, say, how God has has maybe put the or taken away these limits, so to speak, so that we don't injure ourselves or, or overreach our bounds or something like right. that. Do you, does it? Does it affect the way we can, in your opinion, does it affect the way that maybe we can trust God to have our best interest or, hmm. or what do you think there? Well, 
sometimes, it, again, again, we're, you know what? I'm not even going to use a movie reference. I'm just going to use all movie plots as, as this, <laughs> yeah. which is <laughs> the best stories are when you don't know what's coming. You don't trust the writer. It's like, why, why is the hero in this predicament? This is not, I don't want to see this. This is bad. However, only the, the writer, only the creator knows the overall plan. You know, tr I, I tell, I joke with people all the time in the Flyers community. I go, trust in the plan. I go, I go, God is perfect. And there's, and I know it doesn't seem like there's, you know, it, it seems like we're going in a direction here. You know, it's like, like on a ship, it's like, oh, we're going to those rocks. We're going to hit those rocks. We are freaking going to hit those rocks. Like, we'll be fine. Don't worry. You got to trust, you know, f there's your faith, which is you, you're, yeah. you have, you believe in something that is counterintuitive to what you're experiencing around you because you 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 know i believe in happy endings i really really do and so far um, uh, and i want to get this in be you know we i've got at least a few more months at least uh but i want to get this in which is everything that i have done in the flat earth community so far has been completely unsolicited by that i mean god put a an amusement park ride car in my living room practically and just said get on and it's like what why would i why would i do this this is silly right but i i've learned uh, what i've learned over the last four years is i do not fight it which is wh whatever for whatever reason i'm supposed to be doing this i didn't want to do this flat earth is stupid flat earth is ridiculous and, and nobody likes flat earth everybody hates it to, to start off with and yet all of a sudden right after i start doing this and, and I, in fact i was on a biblical prophecy show all of a sudden the radio station calls me how'd you like to do a weekly show Okay, what a, and, and and then a book publisher out of London calls me up and says, hey, hey, we'd like to turn your clothes into a book. It's like, okay, sure, why not? And then a, a, a Hollywood team called me up. Hey, we'd like to make a documentary. It's like, really? It's like, yeah, you don't have to do anything. We'll come up to you. It's going to be great. And, and then you watch this and you know the odds of all these things. The failure, the failure rates of all these things is extremely high. I mean, the documentary alone, you got to understand here, a perfect example. Again, I had nothing to do with the making of it. Um, mm. There are just for in that year alone, there were 3000 documentaries submitted to the Toronto Film Festival. 3000. They only pick 100 of them. And we got in. And then from those 100, <laughs> and that's just the first film festival. We did 27 film festivals in eight countries. And during that, during those film festival days, there were, and I'm saying, well, are you going to try to sell? It's like, oh, it's never going to sell. It take years to sell if it's going to ever sell at all. It sold in three months. It didn't take years. It took months, and then everybody bought it uh, towards the end. And then not only were they buying, it's like it was trending on Netflix. And what I'm saying is, is that for whatever this is, this is where faith comes in for me. Faith for me gets reinforced by things that don't make sense. That I had nothing, that are completely unsolicited. I did not want to do any of these things, but I put my faith in God's hands and said, all right, you want me to do this? And you've heard stories like this before from other people. It's sure. like, all right, if this is what you want me to do. In this case, it's like, apparently I have no choice. I was like just ripped out of Boulder, Colorado, and it's like you're just gonna be doing these things. And 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 the point that that was being expressed to me silently was just say yes. Say yes to whatever it is. Just trust me. It's going to be fine. And, you know, from that first moment at, you know, in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, that first, you know, when I woke up and I was literally hearing the entire clues, paragraphs in my own voice. And I hadn't written in years. And it was some of the clearest writing, if not the clearest writing ever, where I just sat down at the computer and just was just typing stuff out. Never rewrote anything. Just re, just re writing and writing and got to the end and I felt like Forrest Gump where you know he was writing when he was running back and forth across the country and it's like well i got <laughs> yeah. there i might as well just turn around and keep running it's like well i finished writing i might as well narrate it well narrate it might as well attach some some slides put it up on youtube <laughs> even though i don't know anything about editing it, what's worse that could happen i'm gonna use a movie reference it's like you're, you're the blues brothers you're on a mission from god yeah <laughs> Yeah, it, it it. Wow, you went there. That's okay. no, no, it, no. Right. Blues Blues Brothers is about as good as any. Where there's for some reason this is supposed to be happening right now. Uh, I even I've even gone so far to say, and again, you might be able to quote the chapter and verse here because I know it's in multiple places, which is it's one of the only things in the Bible which is hidden from you, which is uh oh, was it John? 
where uh, the the guy that was writing the book, I, I know it was at least in Revelation, where he was going to write something down, and the storyteller, whoever the the yeah. he says, do not write whatever right. this is yeah. down. This everything else is fine. This you do not write down. And for me, I think it has something to do with this, which is you know something about the 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 revealing of the world itself. Maybe not the words flat earth. But, but something that we would definitely recognize, words that would be recognized in modern times that people would pick up on later. Because you never, ever see that in any other plot line. And especially in the Bible, it's like, really? Because you're usually right. pretty good about making sure everybody writes down everything word for word. But it's like, yeah, you don't write that down. Nope. <laughs> yeah, Not that, ever. That is in Revelation. It's John writing that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're right on that. Anyway. Well, what uh, else you got? So I've got one question from my, my wife is actually watching. And she, she asks, uh, what does it mean when the scripture says that God will establish his kingdom forever? And she's got forever in, in quotes. I guess that she's talking about what we, what we were talking about earlier about the earth being reset. What does it mean that God's kingdom is established oh, forever? I, th in I think, I think that's earth? a relocation deal. Um, or, okay, okay, it could be one of two things. One is a relocation, but maybe that's too easy. If you're talking about, again, correct me here. If you're talking about the giant glowing kingdom that's dropped down out of the sky that, that lands, um, it could be a permanent thing. Who knows? I mean, I also don't, not only do I think that we're the, not the first, wow, it's double negative. That's tricky. Not only do I think that there are other people that have rented this apartment, but I think there are multiple apartments because God, it's not going to be just a one-off for, for God. I mean, again, I'm not going to say what God wants, but if you're going to make one of these, you're probably going to make more. Uh, and then a point I, I don't want to get into is like, okay, is Jesus in, in control of all of them? I don't know. It doesn't really matter because I'm, I'm addressing the kingdom, the kingdom question, which is, sure. yeah. uh, does God establish a kingdom that it, that is inside this place? And then we just, you know, then he starts new with a whole nother snow globe thing or does, or does the kingdom just exist outside? I suppose the kingdom existing outside is probably the easier one. And then people mm -hmm. are relocated to it. I don't know. We're talking semantics here at that point because he okay. says, well, the kingdom is established. Okay. It's like, I don't know. Dealer's choice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, Chase knows my wife really well and he, she, he knows she's got a penchant for asking questions that make people go, I question everything. Now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the the kingdom, kingdom is established. I mean, the kingdom exists. I don't know where you would put it. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to, my personal thing, I'm going to say it's outside of this and that people are relocated to said kingdom. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, last questions. Strongest and weakest argument. Last two, well, last three questions. Oh, that's fine. That's First fine. one, strongest and weakest arguments, in your opinion, for a globe model. Strongest globe argument, strongest uh, or weakest globe argument. Okay, strongest globe argument. And it's actually, I mean, same thing with the flat earth model because uh, it, it plays into each other. If you had a the separate question, it's like, what's the strongest flat earth and the strongest weak, weakest flat earth? They're, they're, they're the same thing. Um, the strongest globe argument, it's the only one that we just don't know really what's happening because of the optics, which would be the 24-hour Antarctic sun. It's been the same way forever, which is... If the world is a giant dinner plate, a snow globe, and there's only one sun and one moon, that's the tricky part, then the Antarctic, 24 hours on the Arctic, that's easy. 24 hours on the Antarctic, though, is really, really tough because we're talking about a sun that is super, super small by comparison. It's not hundreds of thousands of miles wide. It's less than 50 miles wide. So how can you have a 24-hour sun? Today is today, Tuesday? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, yes. I'm hearing a truck out there the uh 24 hours of sun on the antarctic really really tough to do without multiple light sources mm. so okay. that'd probably be the weakest one and i'm really surprised more people don't hammer on it what we're kind of we luck out with that one because antarctic antarctica is locked down so nobody sure. gets out there anyway so we say <laughs> it'd be like hey prove it and it's like okay yeah go ahead prove it see hang out there go to antarctica one <laughs> one it's the most expensive place to go to ever and you can't run around there. You, you're under military supervision the entire time. Um, the strongest one for us is the easiest one, or the strongest, the, the weakest case for the globe, strongest case for the flat earth is long distance photography. 
And it has been, and it's not even part of the clues. It was something that people just came up with on their own, which is literally, I had nothing to do with this. Remember, I'm the freshman recruiter. People want to come up with their own <laughs> theses. Hey, great, run with it. And that's what they did. They grabbed HD cameras and they just started going to the beaches, ran to the beaches all over the place and started shooting long distance. I'm going, what are you doing? And they said, well, if the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared, and I know it gets more problematic after it gets past 500 miles, but from 500 miles in, it's eight inches per mile squared. And people are listening. It's like, I forgot everything about algebra. It's like, yeah, me too. I know I had to re-memorize this, which is, is eight inches per mile per mile. So it's not like stairs. So because seriously, you can t- tell people this. You can go, it's eight inches per mile. And they'll look at you. They're going, yeah, I'm totally with you. And then I go squared. And they go, huh? They, they, they have no idea what you're talking about. They, seriously, junior high just flashes back to them. It's like, man, I did not study in that class. So it means eight inches per mile per mile, which is so if it's three miles, it's three times three, which is nine times eight inches, which is 72 inches. Ten miles, it gets worse. Ten miles is ten times ten, which is 100 times eight, which is 800 inches. To where you, when you get out to 50 miles, it's 50 times 50 times eight inches, which is almost 1,700 feet. And I'm going, and... And they say, well, if it's 1,700 feet behind the curve, then there shouldn't be anything on the other side of the curve. It should be gone. It's on the other side of the hill. You shouldn't be able to see it anymore. I go, can you see it? And they go, yeah, we can always see it. And I go, what? And that's what HD technology has changed. Where you take a, a decent HD, uh, like a Nikon P900 or 1000 now, with like 80, 80 power zoom on it. And you it's like, so you see a boat, it's gone. So remember, if you remove NASA, let's get into the nuts and bolts real quick, because I, I, we, we still have a few minutes, which is if you remove NASA from the equation, right, prove to me that it's a globe without using some sort of space agency. You only have two arguments left. One is boats going north horizon, and the other is sticks and shadows. But most people don't know sticks and shadows anyway. That's geometry. We won't even get into that. But boats going north horizon, that's easy. Boat leaves, dock you see boat goes off in the distance over water boat is gone you cannot see it anymore it's like well what happened to it and you say well it went over the horizon fine here take this camera zoom in boat pops back into frame so you let boat go off in the distance again it's now gone you crank it up the zoom some more boat pops back into frame well sooner or later you have a problem because that boat should be gone forever and yet it's still always there. In fact, the only limit to seeing that boat is the thickness of the atmosphere itself. Because remember what we're talking uh, through right now is only 99% transparent. And we've seen this thousands of times. People just ran out like idiots to every body of water you could think of. And it's like, look at that lighthouse. It's 80 miles away. Look at that boat. Look at that island. And then people just kept shooting more and more and more footage. And it wasn't a superior mirage. It wasn't an inferior mirage. Uh, you can see it in all light conditions, under any weather conditions, under any just about any distance. Um, military guys would say, oh yeah, we can target it with beam radar. We can blow these things up. We can see it in infrared. Infrared doesn't lie. So how is that even possible? And that is probably the, the single most used thing because everybody can do it. Uh, anybody can walk down yeah. to, I mean, yeah, it costs a little money to buy an HD camera, but your phone will work to, to a certain degree. And so they're saying, okay, does that prove that the earth is absolutely flat? No, but it removes the curve. And if there's no curve, you now have to lean back towards the flat side. Uh, I treat it like a a court case, which is, I say, can I prove to you that right now that the earth is flat? Absolutely. Absolutely not. I cannot prove this to you. Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn? Seriously, is it like there's so many trucks? (laughs) Unbelievable. Can I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat model? Yes, I can. I can do that all day long, and that's how the flat Earth has spread as quickly as it spread because everybody tries to lean on the globe first, and when they can't, it just becomes this empty cardboard box with a few pieces of packing popcorn in it it's like well this looks a lot more attractive the flat earth has now become a more viable option because we've made the arguments really really simple so there you go i got you so oh, uh just from well i obviously i had I, I to add a question in because it's something i've been wanting to ask you since i saw the documentary yeah. uh one of the things that you that you say in the doc is uh you say you know look out over here and you see you know there's seattle right. this isn't math this isn't you know, incomprehensible gibberish. Right. There's Seattle. Right. We shouldn't be able to see it. If the if the curvature is what they say it is, we shouldn't be able to see right. it. And uh, 
and, and it go, kind of goes along with this boats disappearing over the horizon thing. When they show the footage in the dock, what I notice is that I don't see the bottom of the buildings. Yes. That, that and I mean? that is so, and that is and honestly he didn't even want to use that scene and he should have lingered on the reason why he couldn't see the bottom of the building is because there was unfortunately we don't have a, a crow's eye view of it from here uh -huh. um so there's an island part of the island i'm on it literally i think like four miles away from it is a hill and i could okay. have clarified but again we didn't know what, what footage was going to be used so if you yes if you got rid of that hill yeah. you would see most of seattle and okay. even if you didn't use Seattle, uh, the most one of the most uh, famous ones that was used was the Chicago skyline across Lake Michigan, which was, I think, 52, 53 miles. And it's time lapse photography at the beach. I mean, we're talking six feet off the water. So very little difference in terms of, of straight off shooting. And it was 12 hours of time lapse where it went from light to dark. A rainstorm came in. Uh, you know, it was all, and nothing wavered. It, you could see it completely. It wasn't like you were looking at a mirage in the desert or when you're looking, you know, down a hot road, you know, where, where, you know, all the cars start looking like they're hovercraft. Uh, it was absolutely yeah. clear. And people have done that with just about everything. The, the Seattle skyline thing, he didn't dwell on it either, which was fine. He probably could have, but he didn't. Uh, but I think that's because he knew what he was, he, he, the guy, the photographer that was shooting on the beach, he saw that there was a piece of land in front anyway. But the point was you shouldn't have okay. been able to see really any of it. It was, it was far enough away and shouldn't it have been leaning a little bit outwards? Remember, it's not that it's also, it's not that it's just far away, but it's also technically on the other side of this slope. So it should be, you know, the farther away it should be leaning. I mean, I could, I mean, there's so many instances. How about planes? Planes, when they go off in the distance, they never crash into the horizon, meaning that visually right. they never crash. They just go off, 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 and off, and finally they become a single pixel and they disappear. But if you look at it from a curvature standpoint, they should eventually get to the point where they're just nosing down over the hill. And you should be able to see that. And we never, ever see it. But uh, again, hmm. I, th that's nuts and bolts, and this is more of a biblical yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any, any last things before? Unfortunately, I do have to get ready for my other uh, sure. show. Any, any last uh, shots? No, no, no. The, the uh, I, I I got one more question and Chase may have one more question. Okay. Uh, just to bring it back to this side of it, uh, if you were to find out, let's say tomorrow, uh, NASA built or you know or not even NASA, let's say there was a space agency that you trusted right. and they said, hey, we're we're going to show you this, and they just showed you. It, it turned out tomorrow they said this it is a globe and you were there was no way you could deny I'd it. I pop a bottle of champagne. Um, I go back to my normal life. I wouldn't be, I couldn't be happier if that was the case. And everybody, the, every flat earther, secret. Well, it's not even secretly. They quietly, not even quietly. They want it to be disproven. But I'll I'll, I'll do one even better because people have asked me that. It's like okay, first they've asked me what would it take for for you to quit flat Earth? What proof would you need? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, people have said, in fact, there's some radio station that's trying to do a GoFundMe to get uh, you know, some space agency to take me up there, which is fine. It's mm -hmm. never, ever going to happen. You know, they're never they're <laughs> never going to put me in space. I, I get that, uh, which is fine. But there's simpler, easier things to look at. One would be um, real quick would be uh, put just put a 4K camera. You know, you can get those anywhere with a, free with a bowl of soup. I'm pretty sure. Put a 4K camera on top of a capsule and turn it on point it back towards the ground and let it fly and make sure this thing is going off past the moon you know somewhere out out of earth orbit it has never happened in the history of space cinematography no it was never been unedited ever and that is the earth you should see kennedy space center going down below and then the earth eventually turning into a ball and then you're leaving we never ever have ever seen it it's always you get up to a certain point and we switch to computer graphics why why are you switching to computer graphics? In fact, they're not even good computer graphics. So you have any doubt? Look at the, <laughs> look what the Israelis supposedly crash landed on the moon. What a couple weeks ago? Three weeks ago? Did anyone even watch that? Yeah, I didn't get a lot of press. Or I don't know. Here's a, another quick one: would be when the SpaceX Roadster, when that convertible supposedly went to space. Uh, you, oh, there's so many things wrong with that car, and it never ever happened. Nothing exploded. Nothing spider web. Nothing melted. Nothing buckled. Uh, not only that, there were no logos. It was two major companies, Tesla and SpaceX. There were no logos on that car. It should have been covered like NASCAR. Uh, and also <laughs> when they were done, it should have been wall to wall endorsements. In fact, why were they using the convertible? Why don't you use your flagship four door, 
uh, S version. You could have sold the seats to freaking Disney and paid for itself. You could have had in one seat, let's see, Boba Fett, a Stormtrooper, Groot, and <laughs> Iron Man. The thing would have paid for itself. And yet, not only did they not do that, why, after all that, did you see no television commercials to that effect? Why is, was there not a giant banner in every Tesla dealership showing that image? It was a work of history, and they never capitalized on it. Nobody talked about it. It was super, super quiet. Um, so the 4K camera, that would be the one thing. And then last but not least, I'll throw in a simple experiment. And do, will this destroy the globe? No, but it will absolutely put into question everything about the space program, and that is my spacesuit test. My spacesuit challenge, which is... Law of thermodynamics, pressure cannot exist next to no pressure without a barrier. You, you, you blow up a balloon in your hand, you, you let it go, it's going to fly away in all directions a million times out of a million times. It's because of the pressure difference, right? The vacuum, a pure vacuum, is immensely powerful. And yet, why doesn't a spacesuit turn into a basketball? Why, what, what magical thing keeps a spacesuit from turning into a basketball? Because remember, it's pressure. And people say, oh, well, it's layers. It's layers. No, my winter coat has layers. Layers only stops cold. It's not going to stop anything when it comes to pressure. The guy would have turned into instantly into a parade float. No one would have been able to bend their arms or legs. It certainly wouldn't have been able to manipulate their fingers. And yet they did all this uh, all on the moon with, with no resistance whatsoever because people don't know physics. They are not taught this. They just like, you know what? Let's just shoot it with a soft suit. No one's going to figure it out. No one's going to even guess. And no one guessed. No one is like, well, it's obviously working. They're there. And our government wouldn't lie to us. Therefore, it's got to be working. And even if you could convince me in 2019 that there's some magical technology in that backpack that can stop the vacuum of space, tell me how they did it in 1969. Why in 1969 were they running around the moon? Nobody was concerned about anything. No, there was no air of danger. If I was on the moon in 1969 with an analog air system, all I would be caring about is not dying. All I'd be caring about, I, no one talked about their air gauges. It's like, how many minutes we got left, Buzz? I don't know. I think we should go in. Yeah, me too. Oh, what? We're not going to play golf anymore? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's my challenge, which is give me any of the spacesuits from 1969 till now. Put me in a vacuum chamber. Pull the switch. There you go. Set. Tell me how I don't die. So, uh, so final question for me because now I gotta I gotta get to the end of okay. that. So, suppose all this happens yes. and that and your challenges are met. What would it do to your faith? Faith in God. Your your, your what would it do to your your faith in Christ? You as a Christian. Oh no, it wouldn't how, it wouldn't change would anything at all. I would just figure out okay. another way to resolve it. It wouldn't it, that would not rattle. It would not, and that's okay. and that's probably the best part of all. Which is no matter what truth is revealed here, you know, maybe it's another layer. Uh, it would not change. No, I wouldn't go into depression and and start burning crosses or anything like that. So. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't think that yeah. either. Anyway, guys, thank Chase. thank you thank you very much. I hate to do this yeah. to you, but I've got to run because I got four minutes to prep That's for my fine, show. Um, no, completely understandable. Thank you for being with yeah. us. And thank you for your time. Yeah, we appreciate you, Mark. Thanks, Mark Sargent, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hopefully, we'll <laughs> talk you. soon. I'll see you. Yeah, have a good okay. one. Take it easy, Bye -bye. man.